Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our preliminary budget hearing on EDC. Uh, just take a moment to, to thank everybody for coming in on time. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Patchett, uh, and the rest of your team. And I think our, our negotiations and talk, working out questions and working on the budget is exactly how and I think what the city deserves. So I'm excited about today's hearing. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our today's budget hearing. My name is Councilmember Paul Vallone, and I am happy to be the chair of the Council's Economic uh, Development Corp. We are also joined today by members Adrian Adams and Robert Cornegy, council members today. Others will be joining us. Uh, Donovan Richards' son is not feeling well, so um, he'll be asking us questions from his phone. Today, we'll be hearing from the EDC on fiscal 2019 preliminary budget which includes $4.1 in preliminary capital commitment plan. I share the speaker's vision in ensuring that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to all New Yorkers. One area in particular that we are bringing a renewed focus to the city's capital program. For the first time, the council has established a subcommittee to focus exclusively on the capital budget process led by Chair Vanessa Gibson. The subcommittee will play an integral role in the next few months in our oversight of the proposed budget as we strive to reform the capital process. EDC is the city's primary agent for economic development and their principal mandate is to encourage investment and to attract, retain, and create jobs in New York City. As such, this committee is interested in having a robust conversation about how EDC's budget, as laid out in this preliminary plan, connects to the larger job creation and economic development strategies of the city. The mayor has pledged to create 100,000 good paying jobs over the next 10 years, and we are interested to hear how EDC will play a role in achieving this. The fiscal 2019 preliminary capital commitment plan for NYC EDC, which covers fiscal years 2018 through 2022, includes more than $4 billion. This represents approximately 5.5% of the city's total $80 billion preliminary capital plan for fiscal 2018 through 2022. Since EDC only committed 26.7% of its annual capital plan in fiscal 2017, the committee is eager to hear how EDC plans to spend the $1.1 billion in fiscal 2018 that is currently reflected in the commitment plan for the fiscal year. The $4.1 billion capital commitment plan includes, lots of numbers going, $1.3 billion for fiscal 2018-22 in capital funds, such as the Neighborhood Development Fund and the Industrial Development Fund, both of which we'll be taking a look at today. As the recipient of these funds are decided later, the Council is not aware of all the projects when the fiscal 2018 budget was adopted. We would like EDC to provide us with a step-by-step -step description on how these projects are selected and executed, as well as how City Council is involved in the process. In addition to the $4.1 billion in its preliminary capital commitment plan, EDC is also managing 581 projects and nearly 2.5 billion in capital projects for other agencies. The council would like to learn more about how EDC decides which agencies and which projects it will work on. As the speaker has highlighted at the OMB hearing, it is essential that the budget we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and interests of the council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I expect the EDC will be responsive to the questions and concerns of our council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure the fiscal 2019 adopted budget meets the goals the council has set out. I'd like to thank once again James Patchett for coming today and testifying. I'd also like to thank all of EDC staff who has worked tirelessly with us to prepare for this hearing. We'd like, uh, we would not be able to analyze the city's budget at such a detailed level without your cooperation, so thank you. I would also like to thank both my staff and the staff of the Finance Division for their tireless help in preparing this hearing. So let's just do our swearing in, and then I want you to do your testimony. If you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to our council members' questions? I do. Thank you very much, and good morning, and welcome. Good morning. I only get to say I do uh, at these hearings and at my wedding, so. Okay. <laughs> Once. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Vallone and members of the Committee on Economic Development. My name is James Patchett, and I am President and CEO of New York City Economic Development Corporation, which is known as EDC. I am pleased to be back before you to discuss EDC's fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget and the investments we intend to make to build a fairer city today and a stronger city tomorrow. 
I am joined by my colleagues Kim, Kim Vicari, who's our Chief Financial Officer, and Lydia Downing, our Senior Vice President for Government Relations. After my testimony, we're happy to answer any questions you have. EDC is a self-sustaining nonprofit organization that drives and shapes New York City's growth. We use city resources to create a bridge between city agencies, private businesses, and local communities in three key ways. First, we own and operate over 66 million square feet of real estate, which we are constantly improving and upgrading to maximize economic impact. Second, we build neighborhood infrastructure to ensure that communities remain affordable. And finally, we invest in growth industries to create good paying jobs for all New Yorkers. Since our last hearing, New York's economy has continued to thrive. Unemployment has fallen for the past three months and now stands at 4.3%. The city has added almost 400,000 jobs since the beginning of the mayoral administration. And overall private sector employment is up 1.7% since December 2016. Wages have also increased by roughly 3% during that time, giving more New Yorkers access to basic needs and improving their quality of life. However, right now we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Some economists caution that the U.S. is in a pre-bubble stage and that this will likely be a there will likely be a recession in the coming years. And even though the city's economy is booming, too many York New Yorkers are being excluded from our unprecedented economic prosperity. While the number of New Yorkers living at the federal poverty level is roughly 20 percent, the number of New Yorkers who live live in or close to poverty jumps to over 44 percent, according to the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity. But EDC is working to level the playing field by creating good middle class jobs, improving access to 21st century industries, and making sure the city remains economically competitive in the future. We are all in on investing in neighborhood infrastructure and industry innovation to increase opportunity. Today, EDC manage hundreds, manages hundreds of projects and a nearly $7 billion 10-year capital plan. Our board approved budget for FY18 is $857 million. This is comprised of EDC's own funds, city capital and expense, city capital and expense. In FY18, we have approximately $2.14 billion in our capital budget for building new space for industrial companies and our assets in Sunset Park and for work on behalf of other agencies including the construction of Andrew Haswell Green Park in Manhattan. The FY19 preliminary budget contains $200 million, $201 million in new city capital and expense funding. The funds allocated EDC are critical for capital projects like the Brooklyn Army Terminal and Bush Terminal and expense funding like our Clean NYC and Graffiti Free NYC programs. NYC Ferry has been a banner project for EDC. We set out to provide a transportation alternative for those for alternative for those in communities that have lacked access to, to traditional systems and ultimately created a network of landings and vessels that were wildly popular with both residents and visitors. Since May of 2017, we have served over 3 million people and are working on launching additional routes this summer. Just last week, I was with the mayor announcing the start of construction on our new Lower East Side landing. We are launching two new routes this summer. The Lower East Side route will serve, serve nearly 1 million riders annually, and the Soundview route in the Bronx will serve nearly 400,000. We've ordered larger capacity vessels to meet this demand, and we'll continue working with the city and OMB to ensure we have the necessary funding to continue this service. Now, I'm going to discuss EDC's progress on some of our most exciting and high-profile projects and initiatives, starting with the administration's jobs plan. Moving into the mayor's second term, we are laser focused on creating new positions and catapulting new industries to success. Last June, City Hall released a 10-year plan titled New York Works, which includes 25 initiatives to create 100,000 jobs over the next decade. This plan makes significant investments in groundbreaking industries, including cybersecurity, freight, life sciences, and manufacturing. All of these fields have high growth potential and can keep our city on the cutting edge. EDC was tasked with implementing the New York Works Plan and has since made notable progress on reaching this goal. For cybersecurity, we have committed to investing $30 million in training, R&D labs, and business accelerators dedicated to early stage cybersecurity firms that want to locate here. This initiative will directly create 3,500 good paying jobs and catalyze another 6,500 across New York's industry. For the life sciences, 
we released an RFEI to find an organization to establish an applied life sciences hub that will address unmet needs in New York City's life science ecosystem. This will include establishing a geographic center for life sciences innovation, collaboration, and expansion. And for our creative and cultural sectors, we are excited to move forward with our plans to build the nation's first publicly funded virtual augmented reality lab. This $6 million investment will create 500 jobs and position New York as the center of this growing industry, as well as provide space for innovators to start and expand their companies. To create good jobs for New Yorkers, it is critical to have updated functional real estate. To that end, we are pleased to have received significant investments for Sunset Park, including in the Brooklyn Army Terminal, known as BAT, and Bush Terminal Park. We plan to use the $99 million allocated in the FY19 budget to create 21st century workspaces, attract two new tenants, and support our growing manufacturing economy. Today, there are 5,000 people working at EDC Assets in Sunset Park. It is our goal to at least double that number to 10,000 over the next 10 years. Our ultimate goal is to reach 20,000 workers on our sites. The number of people employed in the area at the height of World War II it's a lofty goal, but we are up for the challenge. Since 2014, our $150 million has been committed to the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Over 3.1 million square feet have been re renovated, including 555,000 square feet during this administration. A host of other capital improvements have been made to attract tenants, including upgrading elevators, boilers, and other building infrastructure. This year, we also launched BAT's Micro Manufacturing Hub, an ecosystem for growth stage industrial firms to collaborate and grow within the campus. EDC is targeting small firms that need between 1,000 and 5,500 square feet to operate their businesses. We'll be, we will be creating clusters of micro manufacturing firms throughout the site and providing curated programming to facilitate collaboration and growth. This includes speaker series, business-to-business -business networking events, and campus-wide tenant engagement events. We already have a handful of tenants at the hub, including a smoothie company, a coffee machinery company, and a fashion production company, and expect many more to follow suit. For the phase five space, we are tenanting with anchor tenants of up to 150,000 square feet per tenant. There is perhaps no better time to celebrate BAT's progress than in its centennial year, which EDC will celebrate this summer. North of BAT is the Bush Terminal Industrial Campus. As part of the Sunset Park Vision Plan, EDC is working to transform this long dormant site into a public resource with both ample manufacturing and green, state, green space. Anticipated to open in 2020, the Made in New York campus at Bush Terminal will focus on garment manufacturing, film and media production, and related services and industries. To ensure public accessibility of this green space, Bush Terminal Piers Park is now open for the public to enjoy recreational activities. In 2017, with support from Councilmember Menchaca, EDC opened a second entrance to the park at 50th Street in the neighborhood. At a town hall meeting this past December, the mayor announced a $6 million investment in the park to install new lighting, thanks to Councilmember Menchaca's advocacy. Given EDC's presence in Sunset Park, it is critical for us to prioritize community engagement and ensure neighborhood residents can take part in the local economy. Each quarter, we convene the Sunset Park Task Force with the Southwest Industrial, Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. The task force meets to discuss economic development, infrastructure, workforce training, and stakeholder engagement. We are fully committed to this and all other ways to connect residents with the increasing number of jobs at our properties. To date, close to 400 New Yorkers have been employed through the Workforce One Center at BAD. We expect this number to grow significantly by the end of this fiscal year as new tenants move in. Our commitment to engaging local communities in workforce development extends far beyond Sunset Park. We have great, had great success with Hire NYC, a program that was first piloted at EDC and has since expanded to other city agencies. Hire NYC connects the city's local workforce to economic development projects by engaging local workforce development organizations and recruiting with the city's Workforce One system. This free business and hiring service has been a tremendous boon to the development community, which is always looking for top talent. EDC also has a long history of supporting MWBEs, and we are working to exceed the mayor's goal of 30% MWBE participation prior to the 2021 deadline. On projects like Coney West, Hunts Point Meat Market, and East River Waterfront, for example, EDC has obtained commitments representing 34% MWBE utilization, 
or $53.4 million of the $155.7 million contract value. And recently, the mayor announced an additional $20 million in commitments for the Emerging Developer Loan Fund, which provides funding for new developers, including MWBE firms involved in projects throughout the five boroughs. EDC also launched the summer internship program for talented and dedicated students interested in pursuing careers in the life sciences. These full-time, 10-week paid positions are open to students currently enrolled in a New York City-based college or university, or New York City residents currently enrolled in any college or university. We have already secured 13 host companies for the interns, including Pfizer, Roche, BioHealthways, and the New York Stem Cell Foundation, and are hoping to make 100 internship placements this summer. And earlier this year, New York University's Tandon School of Engineering, in partnership with the New York City Cyber Command, launched the new Cyber Fellows, uh, an affordable online master's degree in cybersecurity. This program is a direct response to the mayor's jobs plan calling for 10,000 new cyber jobs in the coming decade. Growing our cybersecurity industry is critical to reaching our 100,000 jobs milestone. This program will open the door for many New Yorkers looking to join an exciting, growing, and high-paying industry. We also work closely with the Doe Fund, an organization that works to break the cycle of incarceration, homelessness, and poverty through workforce development for our graffiti-free NYC program. This initiative provides no-cost graffiti removal for affected commercial, residential, and industrial properties throughout New York City. Clean NYC provides sidewalk power washing to these properties. In tandem, both programs generate goodwill throughout the local business communities and help train, employ, and rehabil rehabilitate segments of the city's population that too often has trouble finding employment. I'd like to spend the last few minutes of my testimony talking about our efforts to make EDC a more inclusive and effective organization. At a time when there is a national reckoning on gender equity in the workplace, we've worked tirelessly to make our company a place where everyone can succeed. Our most recent workforce demographic analysis shows that EDC has a 50% male and 50% female workforce, and the number of female managers has increased to 47%, up from 40% in 2014. Last November, we announced EDC's first ever women's leadership program, which focuses on tackling the systemic barriers that can hold women back. And this April, we will hold an in-person sexual harassment prevention training for the entire company. We also have made great strides in making EDC a more diverse organization that better reflects the city's overall demographic, demographics. Since 2013, the percentage of people of color on staff has increased from 40% to 51% today. We regularly review hiring metrics and processes and are working to strengthen pipeline and summer internship programs that help level the playing field. I am proud to lead an organization that works to empower every single employee and takes deliberate action to close the gender and diversity gaps in the workplace. Whether launching new ferry routes, investing in 21st century industries, or connecting New Yorkers to job opportunities, EDC is fully committed to building a fairer city today and a stronger city tomorrow. Thank you for your continued support and attention this morning. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, President and CEO Patchett. Uh, we have been joined by Council Members Carlino R Rivera, Keith Powers, Peter Koo. Um, and I think that is our crew that we already had, uh, Council Members Corny and Adams. So lots of exciting stuff there. Um, I, I'm going to do uh, kind of first round of questions, and then I'm going to turn it over, because each Council Member has exciting projects they want to talk to you about in their questions. districts. And I think that's pretty much what our focus was at the first hearing, was getting an understanding of the scope and breadth of EDC, how the projects are determined, where current projects are mm -hmm. in certain council members' districts, and where future projects mm -hmm. would be coming in. And I, I think your testimony covered a lot of that, so thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of exciting things that you had in there, and I think the first ones that you touched on, on page four, when uh, we were talking about jobs, mm -hmm. you broke down three sections of some new exciting mm -hmm. job choices and opportunities, especially in the middle class sector. One was cybersecurity, one was life sciences, and one was creative and cultural sectors. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying investing over 30 million in training, and, and I think there's things we can flush out there. Do you have some additional details or a timeline on your sure. expectation for these? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually, we the $30 million is all targeted for 
one central procurement that we're doing to create a new a physical space um, that will be our center for cybersecurity that will be the prime location for a lot of the training and R&D that we're talking about and include a cybersecurity accelerator. We have committed up to $30 million to that. We re released a request for proposals late last year for that cybersecurity initiative. Um, we had over 30 organization resp organizations respond, which included um, you know, academic institutions ac across the academic spectrum from the public universities to the, um, to the well-known private institutions as well as out institutions outside the city. We had accelerators um, respond. We had um, some folks who do uh, sort of non-traditional wor coursework respond. We had workforce development organizations respond. So we really have a fantastic set of responses and we'll be reviewing those over the, ne over the next couple months and hopefully making a big announcement about the future of this program this summer. Do we have locations determined yet, or is that part of the RFP? That's part of the RFP. We don't have any specific location identified at this point. So you're thinking by the end of the summer we'll have, we'll have an update on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's great news. And on the life sciences project, same thing? Do we have a mm -hmm. timeline for there? So we currently have a request for expressions of interest out um, for our life sciences hub, which identified three different sites in the city. Um, one is up on the Upper East Side, um, one is in Lower Manhattan, and the third is in Long Island City. Uh, and we're also making it possible for pr proposers to suggest other locations in the city. Um, and there's up to $100 million in city capital available as a part of that project. Uh, we, the, the RFEI is open until May 17th, so we'll be receiving responses from that um, you know, this summer. I, I, and we're hoping within, I would say, in, we, depending on the process, we may do a second round um, solicitation into an actual RFP, but we're, I, I'm very anxious to make a, a compelling um, designation in this within the next year. I think this is one of the examples where there was a lot of excitement when you made the announcement, mm -hmm. but I think also questions on how other communities or groups can get involved. So yeah. it's open until May 17th, the proposal? May 17th, yeah. So maybe this is an example of where you can flesh out the process. Mm -hmm. So how how is the how are the communities engaged in such a large project as this as to determine the, the three sites that you've, you've you've targeted, which are great sites? But is there an opportunity if another site is found in a in, Absolutely. in the, how can that can be engaged? How can community groups be part of that? Mm -hmm. and how can we make this as ex expansive as possible? Right. No, I think it's a great question. I appreciate it. I think you know the we certainly worked with the. Um, the communities and the council members with the sites that have been identified in the RFP. Um, I think if there are if there are if there are communities who have other locations that they're aware of that they think could be an exciting location for that, um, we can absolutely um, include those as a part of the process. One of the great things about the, using this RFEI approach is that it pro creates a great deal of flexibility for us. So we can, if we, if we want to do a second, second step procurement, as I said, add additional sites in if people identify them. We can also, if we have sites that are referred to us, we can suggest that folks go evaluate them as a part of their proposals. Um, and we also, you know, we held a, uh, an information session as a part of this. And we had over 300 attendees uh, at our offices this last week. So there's clearly a lot of engagement from people across the, um, across the city in this, and you know, we'd be thrilled to have as much engagement as possible. I guess there's an opportunity there for communities, especially community boards, that wouldn't mm -hmm. know of such uh, a large-scale project that mm -hmm. may have properties yeah. that could be used, and the organizations that are looking to partner up mm -hmm. to find the spots. So, yes. So maybe we could expand, um, you know, Queens, Brooklyn, all the different boroughs have s locations that the community are eagerly awaiting mm -hmm. to see what we can do with this space. Yeah. Um, Queens has Willits Point, uh, there's, there's, there's rail yards, there's, yeah. there's many places throughout the city that uh, in the Rockaways, Councilman Richards and Councilman mm -hmm. Ulrich are asking out there yeah. that we could maybe partner up, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't know the groups that are looking. So yeah. maybe we could expand on how we can make that process. Yeah. A little happy to do that, absolutely, yeah. Okay, the, the mayor had listed um, a full list of projects, I guess, within his New York City jobs plan. Do, do you have the breakdown of the projects that EDC has within the mayor's plan, or is the outline of the three programs that you gave to us the complete list of those? So there's, the, the way that the, the jobs plan works is that there are 
four, four different industries that we are targeting. So it's the technology industry, which is we've targeted 30,000 jobs, the life sciences industry and healthcare industries, which are 15,000 jobs, creative and cultural sectors, which are 10,000 jobs, industrial and manufacturing, which is 20,000 jobs, um, and commercial development, which is not an industry, but a, um, a mechanism for in increasing job opportunities is another 25,000 jobs. So, um, you know, I gave a few examples that are, that are initiatives that were specifically cited in the mayor's jobs plan, but by no means is it comprehensive. I mean, in order to achieve these, this objective, we're going to have to have, you know, dozens and dozens of separate initiatives. Well, again, there's, there's the opportunity for some great collaboration. Oh, absolutely. Um, could you expand on the methodology on how those are determined and what gets pushed first and uh -huh. what are on the future projects? Sure. So I think, I mean, it's just, it, it, it is totally uh, project by project. So in, in some cases, like the, yeah, I talked about the, the Brooklyn Army Terminal in my testimony, which is a three million square foot campus in South Brooklyn. Uh, we worked, you know, worked very closely with Council Member Machaca, the Southwest Industrial Development Corporation, and others to talk about the future of that campus and the potential for industrial jobs there. Um, in other cases, like, um, you know, the cybersecurity initiative, that was an idea that came out of EDC um, as in advance of the jobs plan, and we announced it as a, as a program. But then, you know, as we advance it and develop it, we certainly will work closely with the council as well as communities um, about ways to make it uh, as effective as possible. I think, I think one of the criticisms, I think, is uh -huh. the council members' involvement in the selection of the projects mm -hmm. as well as the communities that will benefit or yeah. maybe miss out on an opportunity. Uh -huh. And I think these, these are all such, I, I can't think of another nonprofit corporation that's working with the city that yeah. has this amount of impact mm -hmm. throughout the city and have such a, uh, probably the lifeline that we need as yeah. these. So uh, you'll hear from the council, council members' questions those type of concerns on flushing out these projects and how we can make sure these job initiatives and these job creations can be brought equally throughout uh, the city because because th there are certain areas that are being used and there are many other areas that are not. Absolutely. And just I just been joined by Councilmember Chaki. Your ears must have been ringing on your successful project that <laughs> President Patchett. Yeah, no, that's right. You were waiting for that before you. Came. Yeah, that's um, well. I think yeah, abs I I absolutely hear you. I think the the all I would say about that is you know is that it's also not just about where the, where the physical location of any development is. Um, it's also critical to us that no matter where something is located, that it connect New Yorkers from across the city. And that's why it's extremely important to us to work with you know, workforce development organizations and educational providers to be a pipeline for opportunities. You know, I mean, you know, I live in central Brooklyn. I work in lower Manhattan. I think that's obviously true for a lot of folks. We want to make sure there are job opportunities in neighborhoods like, you know, like Sunset Park, as I was talking about uh, before Councilmember Menchaca walked in, but, you know, but also across the city. But in addition, we really, you know, it does, the job does not have to be in a community for us to be doing everything that we can to ensure that people who live across the city have those opportunities. Well, I think they're on, on I guess you enumerated on page three about the 10-year plan titled New York Works. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be somewhere that I think we need to jump onto that timeline because we have a lot of new council members. We have a mm -hmm. whole, basically new EDC uh, yeah. committee, and I think there is where we could have some increased input mm -hmm. on that timeline before it gets unreachable, before it yeah. goes too beyond our reach. Of I, course, I, yeah, I would love that to. That might be one of the areas that we could look at for a future a hearing topic because there's such critical demand now for jobs for our students and for our, our middle class. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in managing the funds the, the, or, and the plans, it seems like the industrial fund and the neighborhood development fund mm -hmm. are, are two funds that are mentioned. Uh, one industrial was in order, created in order to help stimulate and subsidize the creation of new high packed industrial real estate. Mm -hmm. And the neighborhood development fund was a large uh, project in the 2019 plan, such as the Harlem River Greenway Link. Um, can you explain the, the breakdown between the two, how much of the budget they encompass within all of overall EDC's budget and mm -hmm. how those projects are determined? Sure, so, uh, so the Industrial Development Fund is, is about $41 million in city capital. Um, that's paired with funding from EDC ourselves. We uh, offer about $23 million to contribute to the fund. Um, 
and we anticipate that the fund will also include about $86 million in private investment. Um, so projects for that fund are selected in partnership with the uh, ANHD, the Association for Neighborhood uh, Housing Developers. Um, it's a not-for-profit organization that's an advocate for um, not-for-profit development organizations across the city. It was originally primarily focused on affordable housing, but has, you know, in the last few years really focused on industrial development as well. So they are our partner. They are our sourcing partner for identifying projects. So they work in all of the communities. I'm, I'm sure they have relationships with most council members, and they, they do a lot of very community-based work to identify opportunities across the city, almost exclusively with, almost exclusively with nonprofit developers as a part of this industrial development fund. So that's the sourcing mechanism for the industrial developer fund. Um, for the neighborhood development fund, those projects. So with, with the industrial, with the INF, so then the, the scope of the projects that are determined there, how, how are those determined between your partners? Since one third is your money and it seems like two thirds are the partnership funding, how are those projects timelined and figured out and when are they scoped and how do they come to fruition? So the, so, so ANHD is our fund manager for, for our all intents and purposes. And we've been joined by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. Okay, yeah. So, so you know, ANHD works closely with the private sector developer. For example, um, we the first project as a part of that that we did was in conjunction with an uh, organization that's called GMDC, Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, um, which is a, a fairly well-known nonprofit development organization. So the way that that project came to fruition um, was ANHD worked very closely with GMDC to develop their plans for the project um, and recommended to us a level of funding from the fund, uh, the Industrial Developer Fund, and then, uh, you know, subject to our approvals by our board, we had to provide funding to the, to the transaction. Um, and, uh, so does the board determine then the list of projects and the priority that they're taking? Well, there's, yeah, sorry, sorry. There, there's a, the, in, you know, in that circumstance, there's also a public procurement, a request for expressions of interest that's a part of this process as well. So it's subject to traditional procurement requirements. Well, I mean, but prior to get to the public procurement process, how, how is the decision made on the list of the INF projects? I mean, like any of the projects. I think we're just trying yeah. to find out um, well, okay, and sure, be involved so at the, sure. the, okay. well, the so, beginning right. planning. Of course. So I guess, so there is a, right. So, with, with any of these types of projects, when we do, the, we set up a framework for a, a program like the Industrial Development Fund. You know, it's not unlike affordable housing. Um, we work to develop a framework for this, and then we put out a procurement. And then we follow the procurement requirements to select individual projects. So that is, you have to have a scoring system against different metrics um, that we evaluate the projects against. And then we select the ones that are, that, that are best meet the criteria. And then we always work very closely with the local council members as a part of that. When we've, procured, when we've completed the, the scoring, we will meet with council members and talk about the top respondents um, and go through them and discuss, uh, you know, if they make sure that we're being informed by the, you know, the local elected official about what they would like to see in the project. So I guess that that's the not so much the critical part of it, but that's the component that, that is probably the least involved with other council members and as, as a body as a whole uh -huh. as to the determining of the projects and the interaction between an individual council member and the EDC versus maybe the council and the speaker can be inter interactive with you in determining the list of 2019, 2020, 2021 of projects that we can excitingly work together on. Mm -hmm. um, it almost sounds like the projects are first determined by EDC, and then it's brought to the individual council member for input. I'm trying to see if we can maybe expand that process and be included with EDC's decision process on, on the future projects that are gonna come out through EDC. Yeah, obviously, very happy to have that conversation with you. Great, thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, some of the council members, we started right on time. Council member Adrian Adams was first here, so if you have some questions. And I, th I think five minutes is kind of fair for all of us. We all have exciting projects in it, but if we go over a little bit, that's fine. But we have 13 members on the, on the committee, so we'll try to go through. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Good to uh, see you. President Padgett, welcome. Welcome to, to you, um, CFO Vakari and um, Senior Vice President Downing. Welcome this morning. 
Uh, before I start my questions, I just want to really acknowledge and congratulate you uh, on having a 50-50% uh, workforce dynamic. If only we could get there in the council. Right. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> Not yet, not yet. Uh, but that's an amazing dynamic, and, and it's terrific to hear it. It's very refreshing to hear that. Yeah. Uh, likewise, you're um, taking uh, advantage of um, anti-sexual harassment training and getting ahead of that in April. So congratulations to you uh, on that forefront. Um, as you may or may not know, um, I am the former uh, chairperson of Community Board 12 Queens. And over the years, we've sat in several um, presentations between uh, EDC and DDC uh, collectively at uh, the borough board meetings. Mm -hmm. So my question is not so much on, on projects uh, at this moment, but just to get a clarity or a clear understanding of the relationship between EDC and uh, the Department of Des Design and Construction. Sure. Um, can you expand for us uh, the relationship between the two agencies? Sure. Um, so, so EDC is a, is a you know, 501c3 non-for-profit organization that is under a master contract with the city to perform certain work. Um, DDC is a city agency. Um, we, we actually do relatively little work with DDC. Um, however, we do, we do certain projects on behalf of city agencies that, um, you know, in theory could otherwise be performed by DDC. So I'd say the main relationships between EDC and DDC is um, when there are certain economic development projects that fit our mandate and our organizing documents, uh, we have the authority under our, you know, our organizing legislation and by our board to perform certain capital development projects um, that might otherwise be performed by DDC. Are there currently any projects collectively that you know of that you have in your wheelhouse right now with DDC? Any projects with DDC? With, currently. Um, we do a number of projects. Uh, we collaborate with them on a number of projects. If you can just state I'm sorry, your name. I know we Kim, all know, but everyone else would like Kim to. Kim Vicari, I'm the CFO. Thank we you. collaborate with DDC on a number of projects that we do. We can get you a list of the actual projects that we're doing on their behalf. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I guess my final question in, in another area. In taking a look at um, the um, preliminary mayor's um, uh, management report, it shows that EDC uh, actually closed five out of 17 violations in the first four months of fiscal year 2018. Mm -hmm. um, do you know uh, what sort of violations these were? Can you let us know uh, the nature of the remaining violations as well? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't have a list of the particular violations in front of me. Um, I can tell you typically, uh, most frequently, those are violations from our tenants. So in other words, we're the landlord. We, as I mentioned, have 66 million square feet in the city. So typically, the violations come because a tenant has gotten a violation from some city agency. So we don't, even, we don't necessarily even receive all of the in detailed information about it, but we'll be happy to provide um, a follow-up to you with the specifics. I mean, I think obviously we, we, t we take any issues, uh, you know, very seriously that are related to life safety, um, and, as, you know, those are always remedied as quickly as possible. So you don't, you don't directly get that information coming specifically to you uh, as it pertains to the violations? You don't if, see a list and details and? If it's, I'm just, in, in many cases, those are tenant violations. Okay. So that is, you know, like, if we have a tenant who's an industrial company and the, um, the, And yeah, we've been joined by Councilman And the Lance. sprinkler, yeah, right. And they're, and, well, and, and one, you know, and they have an issue with their, heating system that is a, of a concern to the Department of Buildings, they'll, they will receive a violation. Um, so that would be something that they would receive directly. We typically will get a notice, but it's not necessarily, it's not our responsibility or obligation to fix. Some of them are related to EDC, EDC directly, but we can provide you a full list of them. Okay, so they're not directly your violations per se? Not, not all of them okay. by any means. No. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Adams, I think that's a great idea if we were to require notice of any violations. I think it's only fair that EDC know of any violations that um, maybe we can join together on it. Uh, Council Member Cornegie, if you have some questions. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the fiscal 2019 preliminary capital plan includes projects that receive funding from the City Council. This subset includes 123 projects with a total value of $100.2 million. One of them is uh, La Marqueta Plaza Rehabilitation. Can you just give us a status 
an update on that particular project? On La Marqueta? Yes. Uh, sure, we are, um, you know, we've, we've, we've been working closely with the MTA on that project to advance it. Um, as you know, the, uh, the former speaker was a big advocate of La Marqueta um, and seeing it advanced quickly. Um, we've been working closely with the MTA. We have, uh, we've broken ground on the project. I'm not sure exactly what our completion timeline is, but I'll get it for you while I'm responding. We also were very fortunate as a part of the East Harlem work to receive a $30 million investment in the city in the overall plan for La Marqueta. So that will involve work on not just La Placita, which I think is the area you're referring to, but also uh, a, a redevelopment of, of all of La Marqueta and re the relocation of a couple of different uh, of the properties and a full you know, rehab of the market itself. And my name is Lydia Downing, Senior Vice President for Government Community Relations. Um, on La Placita specifically, that project is well underway. I think we expect that to open in the coming months. So uh, the reason I asked is, um, yeah. as the former chair of uh, small business, that was uh, something that was incredibly important. It was yeah. a, a speaker priority, but also uh, from a small business perspective, absolutely. it was a priority for uh -huh. uh, the council. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You caught me off guard there, Councilmember Corny. Uh, He's quick. He was quick. I love this whole this whole hearing is fun. So, Councilmember Keith Powers, you are next. Thank Followed you. By Council I will Keith. I will take his three minutes <laughs> if uh, Phil will allow me. Uh, I'm good. I have a couple of questions, and since I do have five minutes, just just to get quick updates. Uh, you, you talked about life sciences and the timing. That was a question of mine. What hap after May 17th? What happens to the sites that are not that don't get just three sites? I think. Which what happens to the sites that don't get selected? Um, I mean, I, I don't know that it will be the May 17th. There will be sites that are not selected. I mean, I think when, yeah, when at, at the end of at the end of the day, if not if any particular site is not a part of this RFP, then you know, per particularly the one that's located almost in your district, in uh, my district, almost. or yeah, I don't know. I think well, I think this one is in her district. Yeah, I think but there's a joint district. It's, a, yeah, it's, it's all good. Yeah. 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 I love everyone. Yeah. Um, so and we've been joined by council member. But, we, but I think if you know, with, as it relates to that that particular site or any of them, um, you know, we'd certainly come back and want to have a conversation about what the potential for it was. There are no, no there are no alternative plans for uh, the public health lab site. Um, or the site in East Harlem or the DOE building in Long Island City in the event that there do not end up becoming life sciences projects. Got it. And can you just give us an update on the, on just switching topics to ferry service, uh -huh. the Stives and Co. ferry update yes. on plans and timing? Yeah, so we, well, I mean, right, so we, we so broke. I see it, so. Uh, yeah, we broke, we yeah. broke ground, as I'm yeah. sure you've seen. Uh, we have the cranes out there uh, this morning. We're driving piles um, into the East River. Uh, you know, we, the, the construction will take several months, uh, and we are still expecting and fully on target to open service of both Soundview and the Lower East Side this summer. Guys, this summer. This summer. Okay, great, thank you. And switching topics, we had the last hearing and summering again my Dan Garodna and Kat here on the thousand the jobs plan. The one question I didn't get to ask, I think, last time was more of it was about update on, my questions were about the update on the plans, things mm -hmm. like that. The question I had that I, I didn't get to ask last time was um, f the job creation, the jobs that we're creating, ensuring that both we're looking at existing people who need yeah. skills upgrades mm -hmm. and that we are looking at folks to try to move people into the middle class mm -hmm. in addition to just taking people that are already there and, 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 and yeah. offering them a new job. What are the plans around ensuring that those jobs go to folks that are, are need skills training? How are we upgrading mm -hmm. their skills training? Right. Things like that. Well, I think one of the most exciting elements of the plan is our Apprentice NYC project. Um, which is actually ex exactly targeted to what you're referring to. I think, you know, apprenticeships are a very interesting model. It's a customic common model in the past, but we're trying to integrate in apprenticeships into more and more industries. Um, you know, we've, we're actually kicking off with SBS, um, so the first round of internships, or, or sorry, apprenticeships as a part of the Apprentice NYC program. So it will be people who actually who do not currently have the training and are in lower skilled positions, getting opportunities to actually get full-time jobs and simultaneous training that's provided for and paid, provided by and paid for by the city. Um, so it's our goal to roll out apprentice programs in as many of the industries as possible so that we can ensure that people who are from varying skill levels can get opportunities. Another thing, another great example is in the, um, 
you know, the cybersecurity space that I was, refer I was talking about before, um, you know, a critical element of what we're looking for there is someone who has a very flexible training model. And one of the good things about, you know, computer science is that, you know, you just, you just need a computer to be able to learn it and, and training. And so we're looking for people who are proposing models um, that, you know, allow people from any educational background to come in, learn the skills that are necessary, and then we hope to be able to provide the pipeline directly to the jobs. And, and, and I would just note that I think we're, one of the apprenticeships we're talking about jobs that are outside of the 100,000 job uh, goal as well, I think. Um, but part of the question also that I'll ask and I'll follow up with you on yeah. is connecting the apprenticeships that you're creating or or the job creation mm -hmm. that we're doing under that plan and the specific projects that I think are listed in here mm -hmm. to folks that need the jobs or need the skills up uh, training to do that. But I can follow up with you okay. on that. Sure, point. of course. Last question in I uh, have 42 seconds on the clock. Um, sure. uh, just wanted to get an update on the Greenway. I know that we had kind of spoke about mm -hmm. it. I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting or I'm awaiting uh, more information just on cost updates. Yes. Any new information you can provide to us on the alternatives and the, the costing of it? So, yeah, so you're talking about the flyover, right? The what? The flyover? Fly the yeah, bridge? Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. So we did, yeah, after our last conversation, we did go back and I pulled together a fairly um, detailed analysis. Um, we've also been trying to work with the community to improve the original design. So. So this, this process started in 2009, um, and there was a lot of community engagement at the time, and I realized, obviously, we've changed council members uh, and changed community boards, and so we have to keep talking to the community as a part of that. As a part of that original process, the 54th Street uh, flyover was identified as the, you know, the best possible option. And we, but we did go back and look at the alternatives as we had discussed. The real challenge is the grade change. Um, so 54th Street, um, is by far the lowest of the alternatives, as I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. um, if you go up to 57th Street, it's actually, uh, you'd have to have a ramp. So the ramp at 54th Street would be 360 feet. Um, it could be up as much as 700 feet long um, if you were at 57th Street. Um, so every other location would go, you know, as little as 60, but up to, as I said, 340 feet longer into the neighborhood. So we're talking about a ramp that you know, goes well out into the street and much further into the neighborhood than any other location. Um, and associated with that is a significant additional cost. Uh, we estimated um, that the cost would be, uh, you know, as much as, much as almost a, twice the cost uh, if you went with some of the more extreme options, but at a minimum 20% more expensive to go to the smaller one, to go to the, um, even the one that has the, the least, the smallest change, which was at 55th Street. Um, the, I guess, the, but, but that being said, it's simultaneously what we have done is we worked with the community in response to their considerations, which I think were the concerns from uh, the building at Sutton Place immediately to the north. Um, we've actually, the, originally the bridge was designed to go immediately basically next to the building. We've actually been able to locate it now 107 feet to the south of the building, so providing a meaningful distance. Um, and the other thing that we have done is, you know, based on the design, we've been able to ensure that the, uh, the actual bridge will be at least 12 feet below the lowest level of windows in that property. So we have made significant improvements to the design in response to the consideration. Thank you. I'll follow. I not in the in the you know concerns for time here. I'll I'll follow with you guys. But I appreciate coming with some more information. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank. And we'll thank send you a letter also yeah. about all that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Thank well, Councilmember Powers, I think that's a perfect example of projects that we need to follow up on the inclusion, uh, especially with Councilmember Rivera. They're they're a huge impact to the city and our districts and what. Um, we are doing is creating a list here uh, so that EDC will get back to us on all the questions that we have on these and then we'll determine our future hearings and topics based yeah, on that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I want to note that EDC has been responsive on this one, but we, but we are waiting for more information and, I'm, and I would appreciate if we, you know, follow up as I think they're expecting. 100%. Yeah, I just, I just should, should note, Chair, alone, yes. I mean, we took the council member staff and community members around for a a walk around in this community, uh, I mean, Council Member Powers acknowledges we've, we've met about it directly. Uh, we have shared all this information directly with his staff and we'll be providing a formal written response. So obviously important for oversight, but I don't want it to be thought that we weren't um, providing. No, just audit. that the scope of these projects is so large that yeah. for five minutes we're not gonna be able to. Oh, of course, to, not in this setting. And I Absolutely. appreciate that, Absolutely. Um, you, but you mentioned, and I think we were at the board meeting, and mm -hmm. thank you for that, or yeah. via future board meetings, but you, the board actually voted to include paid internships. 
Yes. So that's, uh -huh. that was a wonderful yeah. inclusion for our students to exactly. have. Exactly. How many of the percentage did you have the breakdown again on the interns? Yeah, no, it's actually about a, th about a, th and well, that's sorry, this summer? Oh, right. Well, we're, we're expecting about 100 interns this summer. Um, we don't have it all finalized, so I don't know what percentage are going to be. That they'll all be paid. Um, they're all going to be paid. They're all paid. They're all paid. These are in life sciences to Council Member Powers, your question. Chair Valen is helping me out, um, which is wisely. Actually, my colleague passed me a note to, to point that out, so we're on the same page. Um, the, we actually, as part of the life sciences effort, we are providing paid internships from people from a wide variety of institutions, including some high school students, um, to get in a first opportunity in the life science industry. They're paid, um, and it's either paid by the city or paid by the company. The larger companies pay, um, and otherwise the city picks up if it's a smaller company. And we're expecting to have over 1,000 interns total as a part of the program. So also your partners yeah. are providing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we have a total number of the internships then between the partners and yours? Well, I think we're expecting 1,000 total. It's 1,000? Yeah. Right, that's okay. And if we can, students now are coming into our offices asking for opportunities. This yeah. would be a perfect time to Absolutely. get Absolutely. Yes. That would be great. So the next uh, council member is Peter Koo, followed by Carlina Rivera. So Peter, my brother from Flushing. <coughs> thank you, uh, Chair Wadong. And then thank you, uh, Mr. Patrick from GDC. Thank you for your leadership, especially at this uh, pre-bubble stage. Uh, Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, Free bubble stage, yeah. your testimony. Yeah. So my question is, uh, uh, in my area, we have Fashion Commons, which is one of the biggest projects in Queens, you know. Mm -hmm. And phase one is done. Uh, they, so my question is, uh, when are they going to do phase two? And then any changes uh, from the previous plan? Uh, Okay, so right, I think our expectation is that uh, construction will start on phase two this summer, which would mean that it would be um, complete no later than 2022. During the start in summer? Yeah. So uh, any p uh, changes from the previous plan, the, the tenants, uh, because uh, before they have a YMCA in there. Uh, is the YMCA still in there? Or? I mean, according to my notes, we're still expecting there to be a 62,000 square foot YMCA as a part of the proper as a part of the project. But you know, I'd, I'd want to make sure we're providing you with the best information. So why don't we provide you with a, a, a detailed write up of what we anticipate the project will include to make sure you have the most current. All right, so, so please, yeah, give give my office an update on yeah. the phase two development. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. happy to do that. We are very interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. So my second question is on the Rutherford Point development. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, previously, you announced with the mayor that we, uh, the city is going to build a thousand affordable housing there. Yes. So, uh, is there any senior housing included? Is there any senior housing? I, I believe there is senior housing as a part of the project. Let me make. Now sure. Specifically for senior citizens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, there is. I just don't have. What's now, the, what's the percentage? Yeah, I gotta find it. One second. Sorry. The total project is 1,100 units um, yeah. of affordable housing. Uh, so one of the buildings is exclusively dedicated to senior housing. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact size of the uh, of the of that building at this time, but I can tell you there's a full building dedicated to senior housing mm -hmm. as a part of the project. So who is going to do the development? The city will pay for it, or so? No, the, will be, it will, the development will be done by our uh, development partners, which is a joint venture between uh, Sterling Properties and related companies. Um, but it will be funded under traditional HPD programs, uh, so it will be overseen by HPD. So, so the total number is 220 units uh, that are senior housing. 220 senior citizens? Yes. So you, you, do you know the location of this place? It's right uh, uh, opposite the city field. Oh, no, I know. It's immediately next to it, yeah. Right? Yes. And uh, the, the behind, uh, behind the, it's in front of the river, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so my question is, where are these uh, families going to do, uh, do shopping? There's nothing there besides right. the city field. Right. And there's no bus stop there. Uh-huh. Well, there's, you know, we are going to be providing as a part of it um, about 20,000 square feet of retail just in the property. So we expect that to be, you know, hopefully a grocery store and other, you know, other, other amenities that are needed for the community that are, that'll be living right there. And, you know, over time, depending on what the, uh, uh, you know, what's determined as a part of the community process, hopefully we can develop more, uh, more opportunities for shopping in the neighborhood. 
Yeah, yeah but go because ahead. Uh, I worry about the, 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 the shopping, mm -hmm. the school. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there is a, there is a get, school as a part of How are they going to get to the, uh, the sh there's no bus stop there, and there's only one subway mm -hmm. stop there, uh, near City Field. So, so it also add council members. It'll create a problem for them. Excuse me, I'm sorry. For the senior housing um, in particular, that's in one of the later phases of the development plan, and that's specifically because we wanted to make sure that more of that neighborhood is built out before we have seniors moving in. So the plan does include open space, a school, um, affordable housing for a wide range of incomes, including senior housing, as well as retail. So the plan is really to make a whole community there. Well, Thank now you. that you just opened that Pandora's box that mm -hmm. we call Willett's Point, um, can you, the plan, that's phase A, correct? What's that? That's phase A? That's phase A1. one, yeah. That's the first six acres out of 23 acres. And that timeline is for um, when so, so right. I know so we're still trying to do some final uh -huh. so wait, so we're Right, so we're going to be, we expect to start construction in 2020 on it. Start construction? Start con well, there's, there's, we have to do remediation on the site, as I'm sure you can imagine, site is fairly. But that's been ongoing. I mean, that's, It has, but yeah. we, the, it hasn't been it hasn't been remediated it, we've been we haven't been doing remediation we have been doing clearing we have to do um, environmental remediation because of you know from the type of work that was being well, done first there. you had to relocate many of the businesses yeah, correct. before you could get to the land and that's yes, what's that's going yes that's correct on. so then the, the remediation has not been started so i, I think what we're going to do and councilman baku i think we'll we'll be on that same page is willits is going to have its own hearing okay. i think what we'll do is we'll flesh out your vision mm -hmm. and make sure that Community Board 7 and Francisco Moyer and all the, the surrounding mm -hmm. council members are part of that. Yeah. I mean, clearly this committee and EDC is gonna have um, the primary focus on that. We wanna make sure that the community's vision for such a, a huge opportunity yeah. uh, at the foot. You know, we've expressed some concerns about putting a school in a building and, and the park space, what it's gonna look like and the future and make sure that all of the components of what yeah. the community board asked for actually gets into that. So. I would be very happy to do that. Um, do you have an idea on the formation of the, the task force that you mentioned would be coming as to when that would first meet and, and what the, what the vis vision for the task force is gonna be? Right. Um, so my understanding is that you know there's been ongoing discussions about it, um, and that there's a there's going to be a meeting with City Hall in the next couple of weeks to finalize the task force. Okay. So just make sure that we're coordinated on that. Absolutely. So we can make yes. sure that Councilmember Koo and myself. I hear you. Yep. And then we have uh, Councilmember Carlina Rivera for some questions. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Clock. I'll speak quickly. Okay. New York pace. Um, so a couple of questions. So you mentioned um, the creative and cultural sectors and $6 million in augmented reality, 500 jobs. Mm -hmm. So do you have plans in your capital budget to support existing creative and cultural organizations? I know this is a new yeah. project, right. but I want to know a little bit about how you're investing in the existing infrastructure of, cre of the creative and cultural sector. Absolutely. So I think, you know, we, you know, the obvious, it's a, it's a, it's a combined effort, but we work very closely with the Department of Cultural Affairs to provide funding to a number of cultural institutions across the city. So we are constantly working closely um, with uh, arts and cultural organizations, large and small. Um, you know, we have we have funding agreements with the with BAM in Brooklyn, with the American Natural Hist the Natural History Museum. We have funding agreements with a series of different theater companies around the city, large and small. We take you know we're very uh, we really are believers in the existing cultural institutions and their ability to expand and how important they are to the, you know, to what New York City represents. All right, I have um, some fabulous arts organizations in my neighborhood that I'd love to talk to you about considering you have a $7 billion capital plan. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of some of the projects that are near and in the district, I wanted to ask a quick question about the tech hub that's currently going through the Euler pro uh, mm -hmm. process. Yep. How many jobs are anticipated for the, the tech hub? Um, I think you know, we're anticipating hundreds of jobs as a part of the tech hub. Hundreds, mm -hmm. all right. How many of them permanent? Oh, I'm, talking, I'm just talking about permanent jobs. There also would be construction jobs created as a part of it. So hundreds of jobs? I mean, hundreds of permanent jobs in addition to the construction jobs that are created in as a part of the program. All right, so to go to a, a project that's very close to my district, Essex Crossing, uh, how many jobs were estimated and I guess were ultimately created for Essex Crossing and how many were local hires? 
I don't have those numbers in front of me. Sorry. Yeah, that program that was a project from that was originally uh, from 2013. Um, I don't have the the job creation numbers as a part of Essex Crossing in detail, but I'm more than happy to provide those to you as a follow up. That would be great. Um, I know uh, Margaret Chin has been overseeing that project, but you mm -hmm. mentioned Hire NYC and connecting local workforce yes. to these uh -huh. jobs. Mm -hmm. And in the last oversight hearing, that was something that was brought up again. Uh -huh. So I just want to make sure that you are connecting with these local workforce organizations. Right. And of course, you know, we're happy to assist you with that. Right. Now, you know, as you know, as a part of the Tech Training Center, one of the critical elements uh, is that there will be a series of workforce development agencies that will have an opportunity to have permanent space right in your district as a part of that project. And of course, those organizations that I know, some of which you know very well, will be working directly with the communities as an opportunity to create and diversify uh, the tech sector. So I think that's a really important element of that project. So um, I'm glad to see your MWBE goal as hopefully being reached prior to the deadline. That mm -hmm. would be great. And, and your diversity, as Councilwoman Adams mentioned, in term, internally at EDC. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a woman's leadership project. W what is that? What it's is an it like? internal women's leadership uh, program. Um, actually, L Lydia is uh, one of our participants. It was, a, it was a program we developed internally. It's a you know, it's just a career development program targeted specifically at women because, you know, I think, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we, at the beginning, you know, a couple of years ago, we had 40% of our managers were women. Now we're at 47%. Obviously, it should be at 50%. Um, and we want to make sure that also we have women represented at all levels of leadership. So I think it's just incumbent on us to be investing in ensuring women are fully supported in their careers. Okay. And talk to, I guess that that was that was a broad description. Well, I mean, I, Lydia's been in the program. You can talk about it. We we could talk about it, yeah. Lydia. Ab well, that's Abbott. why you have such an esteemed table next to you. Yeah, it's clearly you smartly some, surrounded yourself with. There's some great projects you? and and um, development academies that exist. So I'm sure you use some of those best practices. I'm gonna assume. Okay. So Thank I want to talk a, about H and H. Um, you have some things here, including overseeing a billion dollars. Mm -hmm in terms of projects at H and H, 26 projects in total. Mm -hmm. So how has your how have you been interfacing with with H and H throughout this process? You know, historically the council has faced some transparency issues in terms of their reporting. So I'd like a little bit of background on that and some information. Sure. So um, so the the work that EDC is doing in partnership with uh, H and H is is targeted towards the resiliency work. So it's the funding that we received um, after Hurricane Sandy, the federal funding that was received, um, and EDC took on responsibility for completing resiliency work at a variety of hospitals around, this, around the city. Um, you know, Coney Island Hospital is one of the largest ones. We're making good progress out there, but there are a, a series of projects all across the city. And again, these are primary, these are responding to resiliency issues at the hospital uh, and federal standards to ensure that the hospitals are um, you know, in the event that there's another storm like Sandy, that there are not, there's not flooding, that they don't lose power, that there, are, um, that the gener the generators are located at levels where they're not going to be flooded by a storm. So, uh, you know, they're designed. Prim the, the design is done um, in close partnership with H and H. You know, driven by what H and H's design requirements are. But we're um, we're really doing it based on the federal standards for resiliency. And Mr. Chair, if I could just ask one more question related to jobs. So you mentioned in your testimony that you're invested in growing industries. Mm -hmm. However, besides the life sciences, I find that um, this is not really reflective of the healthcare industry in terms of job creation and some of the programs that you highlighted. Uh -huh. uh, so I would love to hear a little bit more about how you're investing in the growing industry of healthcare and those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the two things that I would highlight, um, one is a really important partnership we have with SBS. Um, in workforce development and training uh, for healthcare workers, uh, that's you know, one of our most successful training partnerships. Where we, uh, you know, we partner to provide best-in-class training services and get people from a variety of backgrounds into good quality and, in many cases, union union jobs. Um, and another thing that I would highlight is our um, uh, a program we we a digital health 
program that we run, which is to companies that have new innovative ideas for health services, um, we create a forum for them to interface with the larger health systems um, to present those opportunities to the, large, to the health systems and have an opportunity to have their products taken up because we have a lot of great small companies in New York City who are developing interesting ideas, but it's very hard to get into the hospitals and have those ideas implemented. So we provide a forum to bring those companies together with the hospitals to, to, to both innovate our healthcare practices, but also to get more small businesses in New York supported. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, one, one quick follow-up to the internship. I think Council Member Rosenthal mentioned, so we'd love to link those opportunities to our council. So could you provide to us the, yeah. so we can get to the students who are yes. reaching out to us for summer opportunities? That'd be great. Yeah, great. absolutely Thank will. You. And, and following up on Council Member Rivera's question about the WMBEs, in, in your um, testimony, you mentioned that you want to exceed even the 30 percent of mm -hmm. page seven, that the mayor uh, has set a goal. And I know we're only at 12 percent now. So could you give us like a follow up on how you plan on getting to that great number? You say we're only at 12 percent? Uh, yeah, currently right now the city is running at 12 percent. Oh, oh, the city. Oh, OK. Sorry. Well, yes. Not you, yeah, the city. Right. So I mean, so in FY 18, um, we're optimistic that we will have 30 percent commitment to MWBEs. Um, By this, 18? This year. On commitments. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do this year. So we're, yeah, that, that, yeah and, we, and we, set a, we set a corporate goal, wide goal at the beginning of this uh, fiscal year to try and hit 30 percent, and Kim has been leading the charge on that. Uh, so we're, we're optimistic that we're going to get there. Especially have our MWBE team here. So does that correlate also to the dollar amount of the project? So mm -hmm. That's just that is based on dollar amount. Based it's on. not not based on project amount. It is thirty percent. We expect that of our commitments, um, we of, of the dollars that we commit to projects, we hope we plan and are our goal to hit thirty percent this year. Um, and year to date, uh, twenty four percent of our w awards have been to MWBEs. Thank you. That's encouraging. And now, Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Rosenthal and Lander. Thank you, Chair, and welcome. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you, too. Uh, I Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save my commentary for the end. I'm going to go right into the questions. Okay, please. So uh, the, the, kind of the, the, the bigger framework for New York works, mm -hmm. 100,000 jobs. I'm glad we already started talking a little bit about that. A lot of that, as presented, uh, is, is connected to Sunset Park and Brooklyn Army Terminal mm -hmm. and the activation there. Yeah. We're all very excited about that. How how can you track, and will you be tracking that boost in jobs and kind of capturing that with New Yorkers um, who aren't already in middle class jobs? And mm -hmm. what I'm, I guess what I'm just trying to get to is how many folks are coming in from from unemployment to jobs? Yeah. Are, we, are we kind of shifting people? Mm -hmm. And will you be tra tracking that uh, really because this mayor and EDC and everybody's yeah. kind of focused on kind of an Equality, equality for all, right. and access to economic empowerment. Right. I mean, it's it's it is something of a challenge. I mean, for a variety of reasons and reasons the council has pushed. You know, you, you're somewhat limited in what we can ask people about their employment, uh, you know, history and salary history and other things. Um, so there's it's it can be challenging to gather data about what people's uh, previous. Uh, income was. So as it happens, it's challenging to track what their previous income was for important other reasons. Um, but what we, do, we, have a, we do have a good, uh, you know, for the, for the folks who get referred into jobs directly through our Sunset Park Workforce Center, um, we do have a reasonably good sense of where they came from. So we can, we can, we have some data through that. I think it'll be really important once we see this next phase come online and all of the jobs that are there, because we, we all of those uh, tenants will be required to source their job opportunities through the Workforce Center. So we're going to see a big increase in the number of tenants at Brooklyn Army Terminal who are getting jobs from the Workforce Center. And then I think we'll be able to see a lot better data. So what I'm hearing, it's a challenge. It's not impossible. And you'll, you're already getting some data. We get some data, yeah. OK. So I, I, I want to I work with you to, to, mm -hmm. to yeah. think about that. I would love how to. to. How to remove those challenges where we can, mm -hmm. how to get uh, private actors to acquiesce mm -hmm. to our uh, especially since we're putting so many dollars into of course, this investment. Yeah, yeah. And we, at the end of the day, we, we, we want to know that we have been successful as a mm -hmm. city. And, and so 100%. just because we're creating 100,000 jobs doesn't yeah. mean that we're actually having good impact, positive mm -hmm. impact yeah. to our neighborhood. So I just want to make sure that we can work on that as a committee. The, the, the New York, work, New York um, 
works plan has a $1.4 billion of investment. Will, we, will you kind of delineate portions of that to kind of human capital development, uh, training, job training, basic, basic education? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. So it'd be good to kind of get that mm -hmm. afterwards and get a better sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't see any any mention of the BQX in the testimony, so I wanted to kind of check. Sure. I believe this is a, a very important project for the yeah. mayor, and I wanted to kind of see if there was anything that was there that could help us understand that. Sure. I just don't, I just don't have any new updates for you. I mean, the, the BQX, I mean, as you know, is a, is a very complicated project. It's about 17-mile project crossing two boroughs. Um, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work over the last year doing the extensive engineering analysis as well as doing borings into the streets to determine exactly what utilities are located where so that we have an understanding of what would need to potentially be relocated and what the best route is. You know, it's a big, complicated project, so we just want to make sure we take the time to get all of that analysis correct before we move on to the next step. I didn't mention it in my testimony, but we have been spending quite a bit of time on getting that analysis finalized. So time is money. Mm -hmm. uh, are you tracking that kind of time that the agency is spending on this project? And is that something that you can bring back to the committee? Um, and and not, not just yeah. this committee, but really the committee that we're going to be launching the task force. Uh -huh for the BQX, uh, and that'll be for different conversations. Sure, yeah. But it'd be good, I'm just kind of yeah. offering that as an opportunity to start okay. assembling. It'd be good to understand the investment that we're putting in right now with Yeah, absolutely, capital. happy to do that. I mean, we don't, just, just to preview that, we don't necessarily track what everyone is doing by, like moment by moment, how they're spending their time on every individual project, but I hear your point and I appreciate, we'll, we will be prepared for that conversation. Awesome, and then the second piece is, will will we see anything in the executive budget for the BQX? Are you anticipating some of that coming in this uh -huh. fiscal year, uh, um, for this fiscal year negotiation? Right, well at this stage, you know, we've to date, EDC has funded uh, primarily out of our own funding uh, about well, about $3 million to deal, do the engineering analysis and other things. Um, so it is conceivable that we could continue out of our own funds um, for the foreseeable future. So it may not be anything in the executive budget. And my final comment, Chair, if I could, uh, I just want to say that everything you testified on, on in the relationship that we're building in the district is not only true, um, but encouraged uh, in terms of further continue, continuing building relationships with Sunset Park. Yeah. Uh, Sunset Park his, is one of the largest portfolios that you have in mm -hmm. the city, uh, and we've already kind of seen a turnaround in community engagement mm -hmm. that is really unlocking uh, all the potential that you're talking about. So uh, I just want to concur that everything he said was true. Uh, I know he raised his hand and everything, yeah. but uh, <laughs> as on the ground, uh, we couldn't find a better partner um, with President Patchett and his team. Thank you. Thank Same. you. Thank you. And now Council Member Helen Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Lander. And then Levine. <laughs> and then we have the first round is finished. Thank you so much uh, and welcome. Great Good to, to see, see you as always. Um, I'd like to start with uh, mm. following up on Council Member Vinchaka commanding you right. for. Uh, that's my favorite hearing ever. Yeah, that's always yeah. the best yeah. one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do it once a week. going to be over. I can get rid of it. But uh, <laughs> all the, the work you're doing around sexual harassment training, mm -hmm. anti sexual harassment training. Um, I'm interested in attending your April uh, training, yeah. if that's possible. Absolutely. Uh, it's great. You're always doing cutting edge stuff there. Yeah, I'd be happy to have you. Um, in a hearing yesterday with the MTA and with DOT, we talked about how they're constrained in their uh, bidding, uh, choosing bidders by not having enough competition. Hmm. And, um, you know, in the MTA, I think they've, I don't know what's happened or why, and I'm not going to do that. But um, have you, I, I see that you're looking at cybersecurity, life sciences, mm -hmm. creative and cultural yeah. sectors, but have you considered working with agencies and noting which ones get more competition compared to others and maybe stepping into that as well. So um, DDC now has started breaking its contracts into smaller and smaller bite-sized pieces mm -hmm. in order to encourage new firms to get into the marketplace. Um, 
DOT and DEP, those are monster contracts, mm -hmm. but they're contemplating that as well. Mm -hmm. So would you consider working with them to try to focus on uh, the fields that they are talking about in order to bring more companies to market? For example, Polly Trottenberg yesterday talked about road painting companies. Mm -hmm that um, that was an area uh, which didn't have any competition mm -hmm. historically, right. and they're trying to build New York City firms and encourage New York City firms. Right, yeah, no, um, I'd be absolutely happy to, happy to have that discussion. It's not something that had been brought to my attention before this moment, but I'm happy to talk, about, talk with them about it and talk with you about it. Just, you know, I will, just so you know, we, are, we actually have, we pioneered a program um, called Construct NYC that actually breaks down contracts into a mi pro contracts that are as small as a million dollars right. um, in order to encourage a more greater diversity, and particularly on the MWB front. Yep. So if you could look into that and mm -hmm. let me know, I'd appreciate where yeah. there could be, knowing where there could be collaboration. Sure. Um, I, too, am interested in uh, Councilmember Menchaca's question about the human capital investments. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm hoping that you can sort of cull out that mm -hmm. information yeah. regarding your investments in cybersecurity, yeah, life right. sciences, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and I will just say as a part of that, I mean, in, in some ways we don't know the, 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 the exact numbers yet. I mean, this, one of the central elements of our cybersecurity effort is around human capital development. That's, that is fundamental to our success there. It's probably the most important element of the program. That's what we want to see. It will a little bit depend on the responses that we get in, you know, what, proposal, what, pro, what people propose, um, but that is to me the central and most critical element of our cybersecurity plan is developing a really, you know, meaty education and training program. Do you uh, work, Avi, I know the answer is yes, but mm. you work closely with CUNY. Oh, so. yes, very much so. Okay. Yeah, they, we we want to see them as a part of these pr plans, absolutely. And they have some really, you know, they're actually thinking very innovatively about a lot of these workforce issues. I think that'd be really interesting to track over time, mm -hmm. the growth of the CUNY programs. Yes. And agree. sort of connecting that to real jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, uh, again, Carlos Menchuk and I have been working on uh, worker cooperatives in mm -hmm. the city. Yes. And the city has, uh, th via the city council, mm -hmm. has invested over $3 million a year to um, organizations that foster worker cooperatives. And it's about seven organizations. Mm -hmm. And between them, they've created um, I, I don't know the number off the top, top of my head, but they've created jobs mm -hmm. by supporting these worker cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would consider, EDC would consider a proposal to invest in those companies that are creating jobs? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I, you know, as we've talked about in the past, I think worker cooperatives are a very interesting model for job development. We'd be happy to talk about a way to, you know, partner on a new program around that. I mean, one of the great things about the jobs plan is that it's, a, you know, it's a 10-year plan. It's a framework, but it's not, you know, it's not, we haven't delineated every job for as part of the plan. So I think we're excited about, you know, new and different thing, uh, areas we can invest in. Oh, great. So I'm going to set up a meeting with whoever. Yeah, great. And bring the worker cooperative, uh, the, again, the, the people who do the yeah. work of training. Yes. Great. Thank you very to. much. Thank you. And, and now Councilmember Lander and then Councilmember will be in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Vallone. I'll, I'll open by confessing that uh, doing battle with Seth Pinsky at some of these uh, those hearings many years ago still is one of my fondest memories uh, of my time in the City Council. Okay. But I think for today, I'm mostly going to join the chorus of okay. partnership and enthusiasm nonetheless. Right. Uh, like my colleagues, I'm really interested in the workforce <laughs> development and career pathways mm -hmm. work. Yes. And I guess I might just suggest, Mr. Chair, we really schedule a hearing where we could drill down and focus on what we're doing to make sure that all these jobs we're creating, we're doing everything possible we can to help people move uh, up into, but it's been asked about, so I'm not gonna ask about it today. I'm enthusiastic about the manufacturing investments, mm -hmm. as you know, that you spoke about with uh, Council Member Menchaca. And again, I think it'd be great at some future point if we could really do a drill down hearing on, on manufacturing, uh, both in the public spaces like uh, BAT and the Navy Yard and also in, in private ones as well. Yep. Um, congrats on the ferry, uh, which um, really has had just extraordinary success. 
Um, and I'm grateful this budget, as we talked about at the last hearing, does not include any potential subsidies for Amazon. Yes, uh, yes. I joined some of my colleagues actually from Indianapolis and Austin and Dallas in signing on to Richard Florida's mm -hmm. um, mutual non-aggression pact letter and feel good to be able to do that from a city where the mayor and the EDC president uh, have made that real. So what I want to focus on in my couple minutes today is be, uh, on capital projects management and your role there. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, the council's putting a real renewed focus on that. We have a new and separate subcommittee, um, and we're really trying to drill down a little. Um, so I guess for starters, just remind me, there are this set of essentially superpowers that EDC mm -hmm. has as a result of its creation in state yeah. law uh -huh. that enable it to do things that DDC and other city agencies are not able to do. And you do good management, and there's other reasons why people would want you to manage their projects, but I think people started asking because of that. So can, mm -hmm. can you just remind the council what some of those things are that you guys are able to do in a way that are streamlined uh, relative sure. to other city agencies. Sure. Well, I think, you know, actually, I, I, I will say, um, I, I can tell you what I think is our most effective tool in this. I can't say definitively whether or not it would be possible for another ex agency under existing law to do it or not. But I think the most, the most effective thing that we do is, is under, we have the flexibility under construction management contracts. So what we do is we, we issue, um, a competitive procurement for construction managers at the outset early on because we know we're going to have a series of large-scale projects over time and then for particular projects we competitively procure within that set of construction managers we have pre-designated that allows us to cut down the procurement time substantially so we do the lengthy full procurement process which is the same process that DDC or anyone else does we do that up front years in advance and then we do a series of projects under that existing umbrella as opposed to doing that years long plus procurement for every project. So then once we've competitively procured for a set of contractors, we procure, we, we bid out within that set of contractors for individual projects. So I think that is probably the single most meaningful tool that we have in the way that we approach capital construction that's distinct from other agencies. All right. I guess you know this week may drill down on this yeah. at a separate hearing with that with that subcommittee. But there are some like as you guys relate to ah, Wix law. There's a few other state law issues that, mm -hmm. as at least as I recall, you guys can do some things as a result of your authority yeah. standing. I mean, I guess my my question is this, and I'll just put it out this way. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes when we step into this question about how to get our capital projects managed yeah. as a city on time and on budget, we just accept the structures that we already yeah. have, and we rationalize yeah. why you have this and DDC has mm -hmm. this and the agencies have that, yeah. and then we think what could we do to streamline and mm -hmm. require one less approval yeah, out right. of these yeah. 172 approvals, <laughs> and I know that we've taken a step back and said maybe we should restructure the whole system. It feels to me like you actually run two separate agencies. You run an agency to create jobs for New Yorkers, mm -hmm. and then you run an agency to manage capital projects for other city agencies. And you're good at both those things, but they really are two separate tasks. And then we have a different agency. We call the one that's supposed to manage all the city capital projects, except partly because of your powers and partly because of your history. Lots of agencies would rather have you manage it than them manage it. And I, it just seems to me that we should take a step back and say, do we have the right structures? If, and if there are, in fact, practices like mm -hmm. that other agencies could do, yeah. like the construction manager pre-bid out, mm -hmm. then by all means, let's just get the other agencies doing the things you're doing. Yeah. But if, in fact, what we need is a structural overhaul of how we manage our capital projects, right. let's start there rather than, like, which of those 127 approvals we can right. streamline. <laughs> well, I th thank you. I hear your point. I mean, I guess I would say we, we, we do more than just those things, right? We also, I mean, we're, we do property management for over 60 million square feet of real estate. Um, we run a ferry system. We do hundreds of funding agreements. Um, you know, we do... A, a, a whole lot of things. I'm not trying to break up. No, no, no I'm not. I know. I'm not. I'm not, not I just, I, but I, also, I just didn't want to use a tell a short for all the things that we're doing. <laughs> um, uh, I guess a couple of other other things I would note for you. One thing is because we have our own source of funding, um, we are able to we are sometimes able to start projects before we have a, a, a approved registration through the controller's office. So there are a series of important steps through OMB and the controller's office that everyone has to go through. Sometimes we can get ahead of that because we just take the risk that we will. Um, and so that can help advance projects. Someone says it's a high priority, we got to start it tomorrow. We can take a risk that we won't get the CP registered with the controller. That's one thing we, another thing we can do. 
And then uh, the final thing is we do have the flexibility to do design build at uh, EDC. Or, sorry, we, we, we actually had, um, we got the authorization to do a pilot project design mm -hmm. build and a lot of governments are looking towards yeah. that model to make projects go a lot faster. So right. we would welcome any discussion with this council and on how to improve the process. And if I could just have 30 seconds more for a comment, yeah, Mr. It. Chair. <laughs> I just, course, the thing about all those things is that, and you're, you're talking to a bunch of people to whom they're basically don't have them available to manage the projects that we direct our capital funding mm -hmm. to. So we are endlessly frustrated, yeah. and then we see all the ways you guys are able to move faster mm -hmm. for all these good reasons, and then we notice the projects that can get directed to you for the most part are not the ones that we're trying to move along, and hence the frustration we have, yeah. not with you, but with a process that needs a, an overhaul look at that first order level mm -hmm and not just the tinkering level. So I'll leave it there, but I think this would be a good thing for us to come back to and no, with I, that capital I think project. Councilmember Lenny, you're right on point. I think part of the, the frustration that we have with libraries and parks is that there aren't, they are not able to provide results that you do. So instead of looking what you're doing, we're actually looking, trying to have the other agencies emulate and use some of these procedures. So, I, I, and I think that's where our, not concern, but our, Curiosity is as to how we can immediately start spreading right. this because our the city and our neighbors are just tired waiting. So no, we'll I understand. I mean, I guess this is the last point I would make about this, just in our own uh, defense. Is I mean, a part of it is that we have a, a small agency, right? We're 500 people. We have a, set, a, a limited set of capital projects, so we're able to focus on those. I think you know, as as you grow larger and have more and more obligations, um, and I think as the other agencies have significantly more capital projects than we have at any given time. So, you know, in their defense, it's also, we're fortunate to be able to be targeted on just economic development projects. So that is an advantage that we have that they do not. And then we have Council Member Levine. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Congrats right. on uh, your first hearing, Thank first you, budget hearing. Uh, great to see you, Mr. President. Good to um, see you. I'm excited about the investments in health sciences. I want to ask you about a piece of that, which is university research programs in health sciences, mm -hmm. which are increasingly competing with other states to retain um, the largest and most prestigious research teams. That's As I'm sure you know, when a medical research team gets a grant from the federal government, that grant follows the team. Mm -hmm. It's not tied to the institution. Yeah. So if the Texas Medical Center can recruit a, a team away from New York City, mm -hmm. we lose those jobs. Yeah. And as you well know, those are good paying jobs with great career advancement. We want to keep them. Mm -hmm. um, other states and cities are essentially um, outbidding us. Well, we're not really engaging, but they are offering financial incentives to uh, attract teams away from us. Have you considered understanding the complexities and nuances of engaging in a fight like this, offering financial incentives to keep the teams that have the biggest uh, awards with the biggest number of employees? Um, I, you know, we've I've certainly, well, a couple things I'd say about that. You're absolutely right um, about the structure of the way that NIH grants work. They follow the research teams. Um, I will say overall, New York City is, extremely successful in terms of NIH grants. I think one of the things we benefit the most from is the quality of our research institutions here and the level of NIH funding we receive. I think where we struggle more than at the primary research level is at the commercialization, you know, commercialization, so taking those great research projects into actual companies that start and grow in New York City. Um, but, you know, obviously there's always a competition for talent and especially for top talent. You know, but I would make the same argument on this front as I would make on you know, any other front, which is I don't think New York City has to have a fight with, you know, on a financial incentive basis to try and attract top talent. I argue, same thing I would say about Amazon or J.P. Morgan Chase or anyone who came and said they needed financial incentives in order to stay in the city or come to the city, I would say New York City, um, you know, speaks for itself. It's this fantastic, most talented city in the, in the country. We have the best quality, you know, we have a fantastic quality of life. Um, we're constantly investing in our parks and our education system. Um, it's the safest big city in America. We have a fantastic cultural sector. I think you should you know, come to New York City because of what New York City is, not, um, not based on a financial incentive package. Absolutely. So we're, we're investing $100 million in the Health Sciences Initiative, which is, is infrastructure. I, mm -hmm. I suppose that's the distinction you make. Yes not right. financial subsidies. So mm -hmm. um, 
maybe this should be in the form of infrastructure in yeah. these institutions. I don't know, but yeah. is, is that an important distinction for you, financial versus? Absolutely, it's an I think, yeah, because we're, yes, we, we are willing to invest in a, a physical, um, physical infrastructure that makes the city stronger, whether that is a, um, a, you know, an investment in a new life sciences hub or a new park or a new school. I mean, I think we all view those as elements of infrastructure that stay with the city. Um, but just but just paying a company to come here, I think we distinguish between. But I mean, that's part of the reason for the 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 life sciences work that we're doing in general, which is to try and create more of a more research and develop R&D excitement in the life sciences in New York City, I think that'll be another thing that continues to attract people. We have this fantastic medical corridor, as you know, both on the east side um, and uh, you know, at Columbia, and we, you know, we really have to continue to cultivate that and turn it into more, you know, more jobs. Um, I want to move on to another topic before my time is out, but th they're reporting, at least anecdotally, these great institutions that they're, they're losing uh, mm -hmm. what they see as an accelerating number of teams. Mm -hmm. uh, we should probably work to get yeah. real stats on that, but there does appear to be a problem here and, and, and a war that we may not be winning. A brain just just yeah. very quickly on, on your much beloved um, ferry service uh, yes. and incredible success, which I celebrate. Um, when I look at the beautiful map with all the multicolored lines, uh -huh. I can't help but noticing there's no beautiful lines on the west side of Manhattan. Right, yeah. And this is a corridor where the main transit line, the one train, is at capacity. Uh, it goes right along the river. And unlike a lot of the other places where you've looked at instituting ferry service, there are already um, yes. piers that are ready for ferries or even already serving ferries mm -hmm. all up and down. We have them at Dykeman Street, we have them at 125th Street, at 79th Street, at, at yeah. whatever, all the way down Manhattan. So um, have you thought about um, expanding uh, to the west side of Manhattan in a future stage? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I think in, in general, the west side of Manhattan is, and other neighborhoods across the city, we've, you know, we've heard from the west side, Coney Island, Staten Island, um, a lot of different areas that, you know, that believe, and, and upper Manhattan, that, uh, you know, that we should continue to expand the service. You know, we are huge believers in the success of the system. This year, we are opening two new lines. So it is our objective to get those lines successfully opened up, get the system able to manage the incredible demand that we've had, and then, you know, evaluate future opportunities. So I hear your point about the west side. would love to have that conversation. I think for now, we're dead focused on getting this summer set up for success, for success and then happy to have the ongoing discussion about what the future of the system looks like. All right. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So thank you to my fellow council members. Thank you to uh, Alex Polinoff, our council, and Aliyah Ali on the left and right of me to make this such a wonderful hearing. If you'd like to, um, can we close? And I know we have the executive budget hearing coming up, so we'd like to follow up with a lot of the questions yep. that were done today. And I, I think the, I'll just make my last note because there are so many things. Uh, the wonderful part about EDC is we could really talk all day. And <laughs> I, I know you have so many different obligations. But the, the ferry service that you heard, I think, from all the council members, mm -hmm. and I think you even mentioned at your last board hearing on how much time, energy, and resources it does take for EDC to manage this mm -hmm. great program. There, I don't think there's a district in the city that's not crying for it to be extended. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just like Council Member Levine, where all of Northeast Queens has no yeah. access, and we have some ferries that are ready to use at Cityfield Marina and, and uh, Fort Totten. There's certain things that we can look at. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we have a separate follow-up hearing just on ferry service. And one of my outside thoughts is maybe we create a separate city agency to let them take that and just deal with it since it's such a success and the administration's pushing, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Vision Zero and different initiatives, but there are districts out in the outer boroughs that can't get to Manhattan because there's no train, there's no yeah. place else, so we have to drive. So maybe the ferries would be a great way to take that off your plate and just let a whole separate agency, maybe we just create a separate funding stream and an agency to deal with it. Um, <laughs> Use the template you've yeah. done no, I, I, and let, I, let it not, grow. I'm not, I, we'd be happy to discuss that. Um, it, is, it is, you know, I think one of the things we pride ourselves on at EDC is, you know, getting innovative and exciting projects up and running. Um, I hear your point about, you know, what makes sense? It is. It is a tremendous focus operating uh, ferry system, and something we're thrilled and excited to be running. But I hear your question about you know long-term 
what the infrastructure is that makes sense for it. I think it's a good thought. Um, yeah, I just will also say, I think as we think about expansion, we have to get our hands around, you know, what is the cost of meeting the current demand that we have in front of us, and, you know, as we prepare for the summer and the future, as, and then look towards future expansion, I think, you know, that's something we're working very closely with OMB and our operator on right now, and, you know, we chartered additional vessels last summer, and we'll be doing more work this summer to, uh, you know, to make sure the system can meet all of the enormous demand, and then talk about expansion. All right. Well, thank you, President Patchett, and your fabulous team. Uh, thank you. For this hearing, and we have two panels, I believe, correct? So we can let you guys go. Great. Thank you, you so have much. A busy day. Thank you to my council members. We have two panels. On the first panel, we have John Falcone, Alex Camarda, Jesse Lehman, and Robin Vitali. Those are our first. On the, and then we have one more panel, right? One more panel after that. Thank you to the advocates and folks who I'd stay. We appreciate when you stay around. Leave up to the four of you who would like to start first. Just make sure you introduce yourself. And Thank you so much, Chair. My name is Robin Vitale, and I serve as Vice President of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association. And uh, your Sergeant Norms very kindly asked if I was lost. Um, indeed, I'm not. <laughs> we are very much interested as an organization regarding where healthy hearts can often benefit from a healthy economy. So we appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of you, um, specifically about one of our premier campaigns related to improving access to healthy foods for all New Yorkers. Um, we're very interested in a suite of proposals which are outlined in the written testimony, but I want to draw your attention specifically to one of those proposals, which is um, trying to replicate some work that had been done previously at the state level, but is no longer being funded. We would like to propose a city-specific healthy food financing initiative. Um, at the state level, the Healthy Food, Healthy Community Fund, um, which was established back in 2010, with an initial investment of just $10 million, ultimately resulted in close to $200 million of investment in healthy food retail infrastructure. It was a really impressive program. It, uh, by itself, really motivated more than 20 healthy food retail projects around the state of New York. Unfortunately, the state has ceased funding it, and we're obviously rather concerned about that. We know that many New Yorkers are struggling with diet-related illnesses, and access to affordable, healthy food is a strong indicator as part of that concern. So with that Healthy Food, Healthy Communities Fund, um, it's just important to realize that not only did those um, new food markets open up in low-income, underserved neighborhoods, but it also helped to create jobs for people living in those neighborhoods. Um, in fact, with those projects, it resulted in approximately 450 full-time employment positions, as well as close to 630 construction jobs, significant economic impact, and obviously, from our perspective, a wonderful perspective, a wonderful focus on improving access to healthy foods. So that is one initiative that we were calling on the city to invest in um, to replicate the impact, a $10 million investment out of the city budget to establish a city-specific HFFI. Uh, that would obviously be a complementary approach to some of the other proposals we've outlined in our testimony, um, not only to improve the retail environment, but also to incentivize New Yorkers to purchase healthy foods. Um, so we're very excited to have this conversation with you today and open to any questions you might have. Uh, Robin, that's not just a conversation just for retail. So a lot of the council members like ourselves want to expand the healthy food initiative to our seniors, to our schools. Um, we just our, our senior centers and the funding that we're providing for choices is not enough. And whether it's cultural-based foods or healthy foods, we totally agree. So thank you for bringing that up today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Still uh, hanging in there. Yeah, uh, just made it under, yeah. Uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the Director of Policy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. The Employment and Training Coalition is the umbrella organization that represents all the groups in New York that do any sort of job training or job placement services, including our community colleges, labor unions that have apprenticeship programs, community-based organizations such as settlement houses, and the like. Uh, and with regard to EDC, we're really pleased to see 
having this hearing and doing oversight over EDC this year because we think it's an often overlooked part of the city's ability to affect income inequality uh, and opportunity for New Yorkers. Uh, the, we have four observations and questions that I'd like to try to quickly make today. Uh, and the, the overarching one right off the top is that we have to remember that New York City is still facing what Mayor de Blasio has called out as the tale of two cities. We are still a deeply unequal city that is becoming more unaffordable for a lot of New Yorkers, even as we are having more and more opportunity, job growth, and economic growth across the city. And as, the, as James Patchett pointed out, an unemployment rate that is down around 4% citywide, but not across all communities. And so we must remember that if the city is going to make billions of dollars in investments in creating new industries, new jobs, and new places to work, that those investments will either make things better and close the gap between people living in poverty and people making good wages now, or they will make things worse and they will exacerbate the problem. If we create 100,000 new jobs and all of those new, good new jobs go to people who move to New York City with college degrees and, and, and come here to fill those positions, that will only increase the costs for people that are living in the city and don't have access to those pathways. So we need to make sure that these 100,000 new jobs and beyond are going to New Yorkers who weren't already on track for the middle class. That is our uh, across the board top concern and I want to thank Council Members Powers, Menchaca, Rosenthal, Lander all brought up variations on that top concern. I agree. Uh, Councilman Lander suggested that this committee could have a follow-up hearing specifically on the, the need to tie workforce development to the New York Works Plan and I would love to see that hearing. I think it would be a really educational opportunity. Um, so I'll quickly make the other three points which is that one I do want to give some credit uh, to EDC, credit where credit is due, the first RFP. Just want to acknowledge you've been joined by Councilmember Barron. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, the first uh, RFP under the New York Works Plan, the Cyber NYC RFP that, the, that James Patchett alluded to, does have within it uh, one of the three tracks for uh, talent partnerships, for training. Uh, that's good to see, and I hope that that will be a model for all of the RFPs to follow under the $1.4 billion New York Works Plan. Uh, so this is a, it's a good start and I hope that it, it portends of the future. Um, the third thing is that, uh, you know, stepping back from just that one RFP, and then this alludes to a question that Councilman Menchaca asked, across the $1.4 billion New York Works Plan, uh, what is the actual amount of money that EDC is hoping to spend on people? on New Yorkers uh, through training and through job placement services. We did hear that they are intending to spend some and we, I, I heard some really good words from James Patchett today, but we did not hear a number and we've never seen a number. Uh, it is our coalition's position that at least 10% of the money getting spent on creating good new jobs in New York needs to be spent on New Yorkers getting good new jobs. Uh, less than 10% would be kind of shocking. Agreed. Uh, and uh, the final point uh, ties into Mayor de Blasio's first plan to create and link uh, good jobs to New Yorkers, which was the Career Pathways Plan. Uh, the New York Works Plan came out last year. Career Pathways is now almost four years old, uh, and that was a plan really aimed at people living in poverty and people who did not have the education and training already to get into the middle class. It was a plan developed by New York City employers, nonprofit uh, providers, and community members. It's a great plan, and four years on, it is desperately lacking in funding. Uh, and so one of the questions we have is why isn't EDC part of the conversation around funding the mayor's career pathways plan. Uh, in particular, one part of that plan that is way behind track is the promise of $60 million annually in funding for bridge programming. Those are programs that help people that are lacking basic skills get to either higher education or employment. Uh, right now, under $10 million a year is being spent out of that $60 million annual promise. We think EDC could be part of the answer uh, and spending some money on bridge programs linked to these new sectors that EDC is promising uh, will create new jobs. It is a natural linkage and we think that, that it's something, a role that EDC could play. Uh, so we would like to see that you know, discussed and, and we'd like to see some oversight on that Career Pathways plan and the linkage to EDC in the future. Well, in today's hearing it came out that we want to follow up on a specific hearing on the jobs. Yes. This is such an important Absolutely. part, whether it's new jobs, um, existing jobs, creation of jobs, supporting small businesses that are the key to giving the jobs. 
where our bids are and with this, where our impoverished communities are with this, where our high school students, college students, and the different programs. That's why we talked about the internships a lot. So right. we, 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 we hear you, um, and I think you couldn't ask for a better organization to have the ability to provide those answers. So, and the SBS that you just brought up, it used to be part of EDC's um, purview, but now we've separated small business solely back. So I think we're going to like to do- I'll be like in this do, room this afternoon for that. But as Aliyah just said, we'll, yeah. we'll yes, stay, but we're going to make sure that they address that this afternoon and their budget right. hearing, and we will have a joint hearing at some point, because I think it's important, because you can't really separate EDC from Correct. small business just because it's a different committee. Right. I think we need to be together on that. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hi, hey, uh, good morning, Chair Vallone and members of the Council Committee on Economic Development. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. Uh, reInvent Albany focuses on government transparency and accountability in the state capital, including business subsidies, which are administered here uh, in the city by EDC. We also weigh in on city open government matters, and we've been a leading voice in New York City on issues like open data and the Freedom of Information Law FOIL. Uh, we have also previously testified at length before this committee on transparency as it relates to economic development. Uh, EDC generally over the last few years has um, taken a number of measures to make its work more transparent. One of the most significant was a law that uh, Councilmember Rosenthal was involved in, Local Law 222, which passed in December 2017 and reInvent Albany supported. Uh, what that law do, does is it codifies a lot of the existing practice by EDC to put particular project information in a spreadsheet that makes it available on its website. And for each project, you're able to see project details like the name and location of the project, the type of benefits that are received, the subsidy amount, the different types of jobs produced, and any uh, restriction or curtailment of benefits when project goals are not met. So any specific questions that council members or the public have about uh, particular projects, that spreadsheet should be able to provide the information. Uh, we believe that's a model for state government, which does not provide this data, and we've encouraged them to do so. Uh, in addition to implementing this law, uh, Local Law 222, we also believe that EDC can build on the foundation of transparency it's established already by take, uh, taking a, a number of additional steps, uh, which we've enumerated here, and I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, first, the city's open data portal uh, it was created uh, by law uh, that the city council passed. Uh, many agencies are required to put information into this uh, portal. EDC needs to do a better job of it. To date, they only have seven data sets in this portal. They do have uh, many data sets on their website. Some are locked in PDFs, but we'd like to see their information about economic development projects put in the city's open data portal. We'd like to see that data automated so the updates occur in real time and the council and stakeholders have to spend less of their time asking EDC for information because it's already there and instantly updated. Um, second, we'd like to see the EDC board and its committee meetings uh, webcast and archive uh, its meetings, as many of the key decisions on projects are made there. We know that two affiliated entities of EDC, the NYC IDA and Build NYC, already webcast and archive their meetings, so we think EDC should do the same. Uh, with respect to FOIL, which is uh, requests of records from EDC and other agencies, we know that EDC is working with Doris, which runs this centralized portal for the Freedom of Information Law. Unfortunately, not all city agencies are yet on the portal. EDC, uh, we're told, is getting on the portal, so that's an encouraging development. Uh, Checkback, Checkbook NYC is a website run by the New York City Comptroller. It shows all the spending uh, by city agencies. EDC, because it's a 501c3 nonprofit organization, it is not on Checkbook NYC. We would like to see all of its spending made transparent to the public. Um, along the same lines, because EDC is a non-for-profit organization, it has to submit a 990 form, which has a lot of information about its operations and its board. Uh, it submits that to the Attorney General's office. 
that information uh, in that report is not on its website, and the information with the Attorney General's office is actually outdated. It's from 2015. There's a lag time when this information is submitted. So we would ask EDC to put the 2017 990 form on their website, so we have critical information about the agency. Um, the next two points deal with contracts. To our knowledge, uh, the city has not made available contracts EDC has with the city to administer uh, many different economic development contracts, and we think that those should be made public. They might have to redact certain portions of them, but we think that's something that should be done. Uh, just generally for the council's information, there are other states that put contracts that the city has, not only with not-for-profit corporations, but um, vendors online and, ma and makes those available. To my knowledge, New York City does not really do that in any significant way. Uh, lastly, uh, EDC, uh, their board and the boards of affiliated entities, Build NYC, IDA. Uh, some of their board members are members from the private sector. Uh, they may have conflicts that come before the board where they're making decisions on projects where board members have a financial or other interest in the vendor or entity that's come before the board. They do have to disclose and recuse those. They are in the board meeting minutes, but there's no uh, one-stop shop where you can look up all the information as to conflicts that board members may have had and disclosed, and we think that should be made available not only for EDC, but really for any authority uh, or nonprofit corporation affiliated with the city where you have private sector members serving on the board. Thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, Chair Vallone and other distinguished members of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, my name is JT Falcone. I'm the Senior Associate of Workforce and Economic Development at Jobs First NYC, a policy to practice intermediary focused on improving the workforce development system and ensuring all New Yorkers are in a position to access and climb the economic ladder of New York City's labor market. Last month, I testified before this committee in order to lift up the work of the Lower East Side Employment Network, the lesson. I shared that the lesson is a coalition of eight nonprofit agencies working together in partnership with their local community board, CB3, that it has served the needs of residents of the Lower East Side while that neighborhood has seen a swell of economic development activity, and that it has done so by ensuring that local residents are appropriately trained for and positioned to benefit from the job opportunities that result from economic development in the area. Good to hear you shout it out today. Uh, you will remember that by agreeing to collaborate rather than compete, these eight nonprofits have improved their engagement of local employers and developers, all to the benefit of residents of the Lower East Side. And with CB3 as a partner, Lesson is able to leverage this strong relationship to negotiate with incoming employers. Today, I'd like to tell you about another partnership Jobs First NYC has helped to develop, the Youth Workforce Initiative Network of Staten Island, which goes by Youth Wins. Youth Wins is a workforce partnership between the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce, the College of Staten Island, and local training partners like NYSID, United Activities Unlimited, the Staten Island Partnership for Community Wellness, and others who have deep, long-standing connections with the young adults who call Staten Island home. Collectively, Youth Wins offers bridge programs, industry-recognized credentials, and connections to employment for young adults who would otherwise be out of school and out of work. Like Lesson, by collaborating and aligning resources, the nonprofits can offer a wider array of services without duplicating each other's offerings, saving precious dollars. That's another example for you, Chair Vallone. Well, we want you to expand all of this, so you're in trouble, so would you get ready. I am uh, before the committee today in partnership with my colleague from the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and the workforce field at large to ask that you devote new resources to training New Yorkers and linking them to quality jobs with a mission to create shared prosperity across New York City's five boroughs by strengthening neighborhoods and growing good jobs. It seems only logical to me that the EDC would take responsibility for investing in local community partnerships and support a portion of the city's $60 million annual commitment to bridge programs from 2020 onward. This approach would go a long way towards supporting the development of models like Lesson and Youth Wins, where nonprofit organizations with long histories and communities are able to train local residents and prepare them for quality jobs. As I said in my last testimony, these models are costly, and they require hard-to-come-by planning dollars to offset the cost of development. Youth Wins took two years of intensive planning meetings and a long on-ramp to launch. 
All of that time is a significant drain on resources, not only for Jobs First NYC and the Staten Island Foundation who convene those meetings, but for the nonprofit, nonprofits who need to devote executive time on budgets that often cap administrative fees at 10%. While the city looks to invest in its physical infrastructure through the work of NYC EDC, we believe that the investments we are requesting will go a long way towards the establishment of infrastructure for its community-based organizations and workforce partners. It is this kind of infrastructure that is necessary to help communities respond to and benefit from the economic activity the EDC stimulates in accordance with its mission. By contributing to the existing commitment to bridge programs, the EDC can ensure that it not only shares prosperity across New York City's five boroughs, but that its developers and businesses have access to the kind of talent they need to succeed. From Sunset Park to the South Bronx, Bed-Stuy to the North Shore of Staten Island, communities are clamoring to establish their own nonprofit partnerships and develop programs that will train local residents. But without the dollars necessary to plan and develop these systems together, they might move on as other priorities arise. It's a win-win-win. Let's not let the moment pass. So JT and everyone, thank you. Uh, the projects in the Lower East Side and Staten Island are, are envious of the rest of the council members because we'd love to see, and we spoke about it at the last hearing, and a lot of it comes down to funding and expanding the amount of work. So when President Patchett was here, we talked about making sure there's that inclusionary process um, at the outset because so many of these projects, we find out, as you find out, that they're already on the way and miss this opportunity of growth. So yeah. here. And I know Councilmember Powers has a couple. Yeah, questions. thank you. And thank you all for testifying and, and, and uh, uh, speaking on some of the things that we had spoke about earlier around the need to connect uh, the programs that we're creating around jobs to actually jobs that New Yorkers need and ensuring that uh, they're, we're taking people that, uh, you know, moving people into the middle class that are that not just replacing one person with a job, with, a, with another person's job. And I think our, one of our goals here on the committee, or one of my goals at least, is to ensure that we have ins oversight and transparency on the programs that we use to create jobs and training so that they're meeting their purpose. We're not just stating them, but we're actually meeting the goals of the, of the programs. And I would echo things that folks had said earlier about Two, two different types of hearings. One is on the Career Pathways Program, how are we meeting our goals or intended goals? And second is the 100,000 jobs. Uh, uh, I, I talk about it often, but when we, when we make declarations that we want to create 100,000 jobs, we all celebrate that, but we want to make sure it happens. And those two things obviously connect to each other as well. Um, I, so, so A, I want to thank you for that and echo, echo the points that you made. Uh, as well. Second, um, to, to Alex, I wanted to thank you for your comments around more transparency in, the, in, in, in oversight. And I, what I like about this panel is sort of the people who are doing the work on the ground and then the folks who are doing the oversight to make sure that uh, the work is, the work meets its purpose. Um, can you give us just a little more information? Uh, you have nine or eight recommendations here. Are there ones on here that you feel could be done immediately by EDC that, and, and you know, some of this is through local reporting that we get to the goals of oversight and transparency, but are there items on here you feel the EDC could be doing somewhat immediately absent a local law? I mean, I think legally they can do all of them, uh, uh, administratively, that they don't need a local law to do these. Yeah, a lot of the ability to do it immediately turns on whether they have the technological capacity to do it. For example, um, their spending, that has to be reported through the uh, comptroller's database, I think right. it's FISA, uh, in order to feed into Checkbook NYC. I have no idea how difficult or easy that is to do uh, on the back end. Obviously, other city agencies have done it, so I would think that they could do it, um, but I have no idea how long that would actually take. And, and I guess some of the structural issues here are related to the fact that it's not a city agency by law? Yeah, I mean, it's a 501c3, not-for-profit, not for uh, created under the state's not-for-profit not for corporation law. So um, much of this would be voluntary, I believe, on their part, uh, rather than a requirement of a city agency. Got it. And I would note that I think they're a city agency, despite what their legal status might be through the law. I think we certainly should treat them like a city agency, and I think they would some 
potentially agree with that too. But so so holding up to the same, some of the same standards around oversight and transparency. Right. I mean, they're they're receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in city funds, so I would think that they should be held in terms of transparency to the same standard as a city agency. Yes. Thank you. So I'd love to follow up at some point with you to talk more about uh, and with the chair perhaps involved as well with ways we can ensure that agencies that are spending millions of dollars on behalf of. Of, of of New York uh, on behalf of New York City, though not always money that sometimes the money they generate um, is done effectively and efficiently, but also that the public has access to all of that and and to the folks that are doing the the work, uh, the direct more services work, obviously committed to making sure that those uh, programs are meeting their goals. And I apologize, I have to run out to a meeting that I'm already late for, but uh, I want to say thank you guys again for being here. Thank, thank you, and thank you to the chair. Thank you, Councilman Ferris. So thank you to four the agents. We, we, we definitely take to heart all of this and will help form our future hearings. So we have another panel. Um, so this will be our last panel for the day. Uh, we have Sadouf Sayal from the Workers' Co-op. We have Osman Azmed, uh, also from Worker Co-ops. Rydia Martinez, um, Worker Co-ops. Eric Kim from the Asian American Federation. And Brian Cunningham from Building Contractors Association. Thank you for staying to the end. So whoever would like to begin, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Cunningham. I'm the general counsel for the Building Contractors Association. Uh, the Building Contractors Association is uh, the New York metro area's oldest association of unionized contractors. Uh, we have been responsible for the last uh, 80 plus years for negotiating collective bargaining agreements with the uh, various uh, uh, unions throughout the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, the reason we're here today, uh, the reason I'm here today, is uh, I wanted to provide a comment and I have a written letter I'd like to submit into the record from the managing director of the Building Contractors Association. Please do. With regards to uh, the uh, budget proposal to uh, fund uh, the local 196 uh, training that's been required uh, through uh, that recently adopted law. Our concern is that the allocation of funds for training is going to directly benefit uh, our non-union contractor competition. The meaning, and what I uh, mean about that is uh, unionized contractors negotiate collective bargaining agreements with the various trade locals, and as part of those collective bargaining agreements, uh, our employer members uh, fund uh, training funds that are administered by uh, the benefit funds uh, uh, that are set up uh, with the various trade locals. So uh, in those collective bargaining agreements, the employers make out-of-pocket contributions from uh, approximately 50 cents to a dollar per hour per worker for specifically dedicated to training, right? Uh, our non-union co uh, competitors and non-union contractors uh, do not make any contribution to any fund because they're obviously not uh, uh, signed to any collective bargaining agreements. So the building contractors uh, has seen the proposed uh, budget and we see an allocation of public funding for this training, and we think that's a direct benefit to non-union co uh, contractors, and we're voicing our opposition to that allocation. We would like to, potentially, if we could engage in, in conversation with the committee and, and the Committee for Small Business on, on some type of mechanism for uh, instituting training that actually, uh, that actually doesn't directly provide a subsidy to what we see as a subsidy to, to the non-union construction industry. And I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity to voice our opinion. 
and if I could submit our letter. Absolutely. Okay. Directly? All right. Our, our security will bring that kit for you. Uh, so thank you so much, Chairperson Malone and Councilmember Barron for sticking around for the public testimony part of this. Uh, my name is Osman Ahmed. I'm from uh, the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. We are a membership-based human services organization, um, and we mostly advocate for anti-poverty initiatives in New York City. I'm here on behalf of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative and to talk about the economic development benefits of worker cooperatives and the progress that we've made in the city over the last four years with City Council's investment in creating businesses, equitable businesses, um, through this funding. Um, basically, as an introduction to worker cooperatives, they are businesses that are democratically owned and run by people who work at that business. Um, and the reason that we are here advocating for worker cooperatives is that they're an equitable form of business formation and creation, and this initiative has spurred that growth in New York City, creating over 84 businesses over the last three years with over 500 jobs. Uh, these businesses tend to have not only economic effects for the city, uh, keeping investments in the city, uh, but also for the workers who now own these businesses. Uh, wages tend to grow up in many industries, people have more control over the jobs that they have, uh, their schedules, and generally it's a healthier company because you know, the workers make the decision about their own work. Um, the last thing I, I'm not going to talk too long because my two colleagues are going to elaborate on certain other points around worker cooperatives, but this eight million investment over the last three years through city funding has really spurred the growth of uh, co-ops in the city. However, we do think that there are opportunities for scale and therefore we are here at the Economic Development Corporation hearing. I believe EDC has a role to play as Councilmember Rosenthal had spoken earlier in spurring the development of co-ops in the city and really providing a space for the incubation and acceleration of these businesses. And lastly, what I'm going to say is we still need council's investment um, in these businesses. Um, last year we were funded through city council at about $3 million and we're asking for about $4 million next year to include more groups who are doing cooperative development work um, and continue to create these jobs. So I'm going to pass it off to Sadaf Sial, who's going to be. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good Mr. afternoon. Hello, and um, members of the Committee on Economic Is that Development. microphone working? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sadaf Sial. I'm the coordinating director at the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, or NICNOC. Um, NICNOC is the local trade association representing worker cooperatives across New York City. The Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative has served to really bolster our sector. Um, it has strengthened existing cooperative businesses, which are overwhelmingly immigrant and women-owned, and it has ensured that worker owners have a voice in their workplace and beyond. The initiative partners uh, that form WCBDI, they have collectively worked to create a comprehensive ecosystem to support worker cooperative businesses, um, and they have worked to create a, an ecosystem that not only ensures the creation of new cooperatives in low-income areas, but also provides the technical assistance needed to sustain those businesses and to create jobs, as well as the education and outreach needed for uh, communities, entrepreneurs, and other, other organizations interested in worker co-ops. So we have seen a growing interest in the worker cooperative model among nonprofit organizations working within various neighborhoods across the city. Worker co-ops are now in all boroughs, with two forming in Staten Island this past year. Initiative partners <clears throat> are not only forming new startups, but they're also creating replication models, um, and they're assisting traditional businesses in converting to worker cooperatives. Finally, we have also seen increasing interest from anchor institutions, academics, unions, city agencies, among others, who recognize the role that co-ops can play in addressing the economic development of underserved communities. The initiative partners look forward to your continued support of WCBDI in order to continue to provide education and support to co-op businesses and to promote the business model to all New York City residents. And um, we thank for the question being posed to NYC EDC and we look forward to following up with them and their openness to explore worker co-ops. Perfect. We will join you Thank in that. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Muy buenas tardes, miembros del Consejo 
del Comité de Desarrollo de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Ruth López Martínez. Uh, soy miembro dueña de la cooperativa Palante Green Clings. Tengo 12 años de ser una inmigrante aquí en, en los Estados Unidos, exactamente en la ciudad de Nueva York. Eh, en los comienzos, mi vida y la de mis compañeras de la cooperativa pues, fue muy difícil. Uh, el hecho de ser una inmigrante nos daba el no tener eh, un, unos, unos oficios, un trabajo que fuera digno, con unos sueldos dignos. Eh, afortunadamente, pues apareció en nuestro camino este sueño llamado Palante Green Clean. Y con esto, pues, se ha podido dar un cambio a toda nuestra vida. Teníamos antes de que existiera Palante compañeras que se ganaban entre 3 y 5 dólares para poder vivir hace tres años. Eh, es, eh, era muy difícil, muy, muy difícil vivir en, en, en la ciudad de Nueva York con un salario entre 3 y 5 dólares. Eh, hoy en día, gracias a nuestro sueño llamado Palante, hemos podi podido darle un vuelco a, a toda nuestra vida y hemos podido vivir con dignidad y con un salario justo, con el cual hemos podido ayudar a nuestras familias aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York y también en nuestros países, que era una de las cosas por las cuales vinimos a esta, a esta ciudad. Eh, hay muchas... Eh, muchas organizaciones que, que nos están tendiendo la mano desde hace tres años, organizaciones como eh, el Centro de la Vida Familiar, como Centro de la Justicia Urbana, como NINOC, que son organizaciones eh, que nos han ayudado no solamente en la parte de capacitación, eh, en los negocios, en la parte financiera, sino que también nos han ayudado a crecer como personas. Hoy nos sentimos muy orgullosos de lo que hemos, hemos logrado, eh, de los avances que hemos tenido eh, intelectuales en crecimiento económico y a nivel de, de, de nuestro negocio. Eh, estamos en un momento en que, en que somos respetados por nuestros clientes, eh, tenemos un salario justo y lo más importante, tenemos nuestra propia compañía, que eso es algo que nos hace sentir muy, pero muy orgullosos. Um, sin embargo, pues siempre hay algo, siempre se necesitan más cosas. Cuando ya creemos que hemos terminado, pues surgen algunas cosas nuevas. En este momento nos hemos dado cuenta que el espacio, un lugar físico donde, donde elaborar, donde nuestro, nuestro negocio realmente pueda marchar en forma positiva, es algo que estamos necesitando en forma urgente. Y igualmente, pues tenemos un sueño, quisiéramos contratar con la ciudad, tener contratos con, con la ciudad para que realmente nuestro negocio llegue a crecer hasta donde queremos. Eh, yo quiero aprovechar este momento para darle las gracias a, a, a las entidades, a las organizaciones, a ustedes y a la comunidad que nos ha ayudado a crecer hasta donde estamos y a sentirnos eh, eh, como nos sentimos, orgullosos de nuestro trabajo, aun cuando es un trabajo que no es fácil, es un trabajo digno y con el cual nos sentimos muy, pero muy bien. Queremos seguir creciendo, por eso queremos pues, eh, seguir comunicándonos con ustedes, eh, tener la oportunidad de seguir dialogando sobre, sobre estas cosas para seguir creciendo nuestra cooperativa, las otras cooperativas también, y poder ayudar a otros emigrantes y a los pequeños negocios de la ciudad de Nueva York. Gracias. Gracias. And your testimony is, is she actually yes, submitted it for anyone who wants to have the wonderful translation that Ruth Lopez has. Were you going to read yes, it? Yes, I was going to read it. I okay, forgot to perfect. mention that before you, you took it right out of my head. speaking. Was... Sorry about that. Um, I will take a second to just read that over in English. It won't be as eloquent. But. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to the distinguished members of the New York City Council Committee um, on on economic development. My name is Ruth Lopez. I am one of the worker owners of Palante Green Cleaning Cooperative. I am an immigrant who has been in this country for 12 years. Initially, living in this country was very difficult. To obtain a dignified job with a fair wage was very difficult for me and my colleagues of the cooperative. We have some folks who just three years ago were making three to five dollars an hour. It was very difficult to live with those wages in New York before we found our dream called Palante. 
We started the Palante Cooperative around three years ago, and we have been able to totally change our lives. Firstly, we have our own company, ours, where we can count on the respect among fellow workers and where we earn fair wages, which allow us to live in dignity in New York and help our families. The organizations that are helping us in this process of starting our own cooperative, like the Center for Family Life, the Ur like, like Urban Justice Center and Nick Knock, have help, helped us not only in our work, but also as individuals, building our capacities around le legal and managerial aspects of the business and help us feel proud of what we've achieved with our cooperative. Without fail, still more is needed. We have identified things like space as something that we need, a place where we can conduct our business better, more efficiently. To contract with city, agency is also, is, city agencies is also a dream of ours, which we aim to reach. This is why I'm here. First, to thank you for the support that has helped us, helped us get to where we are. And secondly, so that you remember us and continue to support the needs we still have. We hope to connect you we hope to connect with you all to maximize our dream called Palante and to help other immigrants and small business owners. Thank you to our, our last panel. Thank you for staying to the end and thank you for the council members and council member Barron. I know she was here right up to the end. Um, we have one more and I, this gives Mr. Kim a chance to end our hearing today with your testimony. So no pressure, it's all on you for today. Thank you. All right, I'll try not to be pressured <laughs> on this one then. All right, well, um, thank you to City Council's Committee on Economic Development and Chair Vallone for providing us the opportunity to submit this testimony. My name is Eric Kim, and I'm the Small Business Project Manager at the Asian American Federation. Asian American Federation's, <clears throat> excuse me, Asian American Federation's mission is to raise the influence and the well-being of the pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. We also come to you today representing our network of over 60 member organizations supporting our community with their work in health and human services, education, economic development, civic participation, and social justice. Asian-owned businesses are vibrant and essential part of the city's economy, accounting for about half of net new economic activity and half of net new paid employment from 2002 to 2012 in New York City. Many of these businesses are important sources of jobs for new Asian immigrants. Despite this impressive statistics, many of these entrepreneurs face challenges due to language barriers, confusing regulations, and dearth of programming to address their specific needs. While their economic output is celebrated, the city's Asian entrepreneurs have difficulty finding the support and resources they need to truly thrive. Asian American Federation is developing programs out of our new EDC-funded office in Flushing, where we are focused on small businesses on Union Street who were negatively impacted by the construction of Flushing Commons. This support includes the following. One, marketing assistance, creating promotional events such as Beauty Salon Week, Restaurant Week, giveaway, giveaways to incentivize local customers to visit Union Street. Two, social media education, helping business owners create accounts and understand the utility of social media, which many are currently lacking. Three, community engagement, installing banners, engaging businesses with local events such as Lunar New Year celebrations, helping with translation services when needed, and hosting information session with the city and state agencies. And four, beautif beautification project, coordinating signage removal and power washing of streets and signs. And last, media coverage, collaborating with more than 10 local ethnic media outlets to cover the overall program and raise the profile of these events within the community. As this programming grows and produces results, the Asian American Federation hopes that we will be able to apply this model and lessons learned to other Asian business enclaves who need help keeping pace in this ever-evolving city. We look forward to sharing with this committee over learning, learning as we move forward. And I would like to thank, you, thank Councilman Peter Koo for securing these funds. And uh, Chair Vallone, I thank you for keeping Bayside very clean. I love your Christmas parade. And Mike, thank you. Thank you to all of you. As you can see, such a breadth and broad scope of our city in front of us. Um, and especially with our strong Asian American community and Queens and throughout the city. Um, I think what most proud was my first co-sponsor bill was to get the Lunar New Year to be finally be recognized as a yes, day sir. off. Now we're working with our Indian family friends to get either Diwali or Holi, one of the two, um, so that we can have everyone. And I think the business component that you all bring to the immigrant communities is so 
critical, especially today when there's such a difference between those who have and those who don't have. Um, you're our hope, so we'll do everything we can to help. Thank you very much. God bless everyone. Thank you. And that concludes our preliminary budget hearing. Thank you very much, everyone.